He said four thirty. Oh no, no, yeah, yeah. Yeah, once it starts it gives you automatic the video just starts when I'm talking to you and there's no introduction, nothing to say anything. Yeah. Am I am I live? We good? Yeah. Probably. Okay, so what Welcome back to the Rothbard Network. I'm sitting here with uh, Walter Block, who actually touched Murray Rothbard. You, you like you shook his hand. So you, I know you have that joke with Mises, where you know, you, you because you shook the hands of people who shook Mises' hand, you never wash your hand. And I, I feel the same way about you shaking your hand because you know you met and you know knew Murray Rothbard. So I, it's great to have you here. Uh, I, I consider you as a pioneer. You know, the, the Mr. Libertarian. You know, since you know Rothbard has left. And you've really taken up the torch, and thank you for everything you do before you. Well, thanks for yeah. the compliment. <laughs> and uh, this is your latest work. So you're working on a private property trilogy, you called it. And this first one here is one of my favorites, which is privatization of roads and highways. And then the second one here is the newest, which is water capitalism, right? And so it's about privatizing oceans and lakes and rivers and just any body of water. So why? Why, why even bother privatizing this stuff. Well, let me just mention the third one in this trilogy, and that is space. No, it's space, right. We should privatize um, the moon and the Mars and mm -hmm. the space race and get rid of NASA also. Why privatize anything? I think the first chapter in each of these books is why privatize anything. Mm -hmm. And there are two reasons. One is ethical or deontological or rights-based, and the other is utilitarian or pragmatic. Uh, let me start with the latter first. Uh, the reason to privatize anything, and by the way, my motto, which I sent out in all emails, is if it moves, privatize it, and if it doesn't move, privatize it, and since everything either moves or doesn't move, privatize everything. Well, what's the pragmatic reason for privatizing stuff? Well, private enterprise more efficient. Yeah, it works. Uh, what are the alternatives to privatization? Well, there are two. One is government ownership, and the third is non-ownership. You know the tragedy of the commons, where you know something just isn't owned. And uh, it's interesting, in the Soviet Union, 97% uh, of the land was um, collectivized farms, mm -hmm. and 3% was private. And on the private part, where the farm workers had their own little plot, on that 3%, they produced 25% of the crops. And on the 97% uh, of the land that was government-owned, uh, collectivized farming, they only produce 75% of the crops. Mm -hmm. So this sort of indicates that when you have private enterprise, uh, you uh, unleash people's incentives, you uh, have a much more rational economy, whereas as Mises under socialism, his book Socialism and Murray Rothbard would point out, when you have uh, government ownership, it's very, very inefficient. Mm -hmm. And a, a similar thing occurs in the water. Uh, according to my rough calculations, um, the Earth is, what is it, um, three quarters um, water? Oh, yeah, like 75 percent. And it. one quarter land. Uh -huh. And on the water, about one percent of the world GDP is produced. Yes. And on the land, about 99 percent. So there's even more of a, a, a divergence from what you, a proportionality mm -hmm. that you'd expect than the Soviet case. Although, to be fair, I mean, you know, water may be tougher to earn GDP or earn <laughs> well, wealth on water than land. <laughs> it's more stable here. Uh, but still, you get this uh, very dramatic difference. And one reason is people's incentives. If you own it, you take care of it. And if the government owns it, uh, you know, th there's no weeding out process. Like, why, why are restaurants pretty good? Why are wristwatches pretty good? Why are shirts pretty good? Why are uh, pens pretty good? Because if they're not good, they go broke. Yeah. And the ones who remain are a little bit better. Whereas in government, y they don't go broke when they screw up. This was one of the things in, uh, in my roads and highways thing. Uh, the reason I started writing that was about 35,000 people a year die on the nation's highways mm -hmm. in the US. And about one tenth, something like 3,000, 3,500 people in Canada die on the nation's highways. And somehow, the, the government highways are never blamed. It's speeding, or drunken driving, yeah, or something else. texting, or something. And my argument there was, well, if we had private roads, and you had a road, and I had a road, and, and I try to reduce the deaths, and you try to reduce the deaths, but you did a great job, and I did a lousy job, people wouldn't come to my road. Mm -hmm. I'd go broke. You might take over my road. 
and we get better management. rules of the road or better mani management. Mm -hmm. So that's the pragmatic reason for why privatize anything. Mm -hmm. uh, the ethical or libertarian or deontological reason is that government is coercive. Yeah, violence. <laughs> a, a government, I, I mean, government exists at the point of a gun. We haven't agreed to be bound by government. Mm -hmm. People say, well, government, you know, we've all agreed the Constitution. I never signed any. Yeah. Constitution. I, I what happens if someone say hey, you vote? You know, we consent to the voting. Well, yes, you vote, but that doesn't mean you consent. Mm -hmm. uh, my uh, favorite example of this is uh, let's get back to slavery. Now, I don't favor slavery. Mm -hmm. There are some people who think I do, but I don't. As a libertarian, <laughs> I really don't. Uh, and suppose that the master said, "You slaves can vote for overseer goody or overseer baddie." And Overseer Goody will beat the crap out of you once a month. Overseer Batty will beat the crap out of you every day, or maybe every hour. Mm -hmm. And he lets us, us slaves vote. And guess what? We all vote for Overseer Goody? Does that mean we approved of the, uh, of the vote, or does it mean oh, we no, approve no, no, of no. anything? No. no. Uh, so just because they let you vote doesn't mean that you've agreed to be bound by the, the whole gestalt or the whole system. Well, no. Perfect answer. That's exactly <laughs> what I'm looking for. Um, but well, let's say using that example that uh, uh, Goody A is you know the uh, private uh, or sorry public roads or public oceans or you know the commons, and it somebody might you know, they'd probably be wrong and explain why they're wrong. They would argue that the the other you know, privatization is more evil and corrupt because what you're talking about is just corporations in charge and they they just want to pollute and. Uh, you know, pass off externalities and stuff. Well, now you're sounding like my old buddy Bernie Sanders. I know, well, that's right. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Old school buddy. Yeah, I'm just playing devil's advocate, just yeah, for the record. No, no, yeah. no, that's, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not accusing you mm -hmm. of being a Bernie Sandersite. Mm -mm. um, uh, Bernie and I went to high school together. We were on the track team together, um, and, and then we overlapped in college for one year, and then he went off to a different college. But uh, it sounds, you know, capitalism. Uh, evil, profits, whatever. But I think you have to distinguish, and this is something that Bernie doesn't, between crony capitalism and laissez-faire capitalism. And I think Bernie is right on crony capitalism, where crony capitalism is defined, where the corporations are hand in glove with the government, mm -hmm. and they get special subsidies and bailouts and privileges, and they're able to make it tough for their competitors to compete with them. A lot of times they, they use that word privatization to explain, you know, government wants to sell off something. Like they're going to privatize it. They don't mean, you know, the way we mean it, homesteading. They mean, like, actually, you know, exclusive contracts to the, you know, political insiders. And right. That, that would be crony capitalism. Yeah, and, crony. and we libertarians oppose that as much as Bernie. Only Bernie doesn't make that distinction. It's not just Bernie. I mean, uh, a lot of people. Uh, Francis, Pope Francis, uh, our politicians. Uh, mm -hmm. Most uh, people in the sociology department in universities <laughs> or uh, religion departments or, uh, I don't know, feminist studies or what have you, they don't make that distinction between crony capitalism and laissez-faire capitalism. And crony capitalism, again, is where government and the corporations are in bed with each other and each one helps the other. The, uh, uh, the corporations, uh, and, and sometimes you have what we call court historians or court economists where they make their money supporting the government and the government gives them subsidies. Yeah. So it's a, sort of an unholy alliance. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, we libertarians certainly reject. On the other hand, there is this thing called laissez-faire capitalism. I invent a better mouse or a better mousetrap. Uh, Disney invented a better mouse. <laughs> uh, somebody invents a better mousetrap. Somebody invents a better, I don't know, pen like this. Mm -hmm. and, and they sell it. And... The selling is a voluntary interaction. Every time a sale takes place, or a purchase, or a borrowing, or a lending, or any commercial interaction in the market, there's mutual benefit. Otherwise, they wouldn't agree. Mm -hmm. You're now wearing a shirt. The shirt costs you, I don't know, uh, 30 bucks. Sure. I deduce, as an Austrian economist, you value that shirt at more than 30 bucks, otherwise you wouldn't have bought it. Mm -hmm. And I also deduced that the guy who sold it to you valued it at less than 30 bucks. He had dozens of them. He was trying to get rid of them. He might have valued them at five cents. So he made a big profit off of you, but you made a big profit off of him. Mm -hmm. Namely, the, the Marxists would say, well, you each exploited the yeah. other. 
But we would say it was mutual benefit. And that's all the market consists of. That is the laissez-faire capitalist market. Mm -hmm. It just consists of voluntary trade, buying, selling, renting, uh, lending money, borrowing money. All, all these things are mutually beneficial. So to say that there's something wrong with that is preposterous. And yet these people, Pope Francis, Bernie Sanders, uh, the, the New York Times, you know, the I don't know, the Globe and Mail in Canada, they they don't they don't see that difference. Uh -huh. And I don't know. I try to drum it into my freshman students <laughs> <laughs> with only moderate success. How does that go, by the way? Does it get worse every year? Do they feel like you, you're triggering them and you're violating their safe space? Uh, well, you know, my school isn't as rabid as some, like Mizzou and Yale. They're, okay. they're, they're really crazy there. Yeah, they're both a bunch of Marxists on staff. Yeah, right? the uh, cultural Marxists. Yeah, yeah. Guess. The worst form, because I don't think people realize it's Marxism. Like, you get the people living under the Soviet Union probably know that they, they hated the guys that were ruling <laughs> them. We have a little different situation, a more insidious form of communism. Yes, precisely. Well, I'm not sure which is worse. <laughs> each yeah, I, is, yeah, each e one's got Each it. one is worse than the other. <laughs> yeah, you could, yeah. <laughs> but... Uh, you know, this uh, trigger warning. By the way, we should probably give out a trigger warning here. Because, oh, of course. Because absolutely, what we yeah. say might, God forbid, offend somebody. Yeah, it's only going to get uh, worse from here. <laughs> yeah, you know, and, and there's no safe space here. And, you know, people mm -hmm. think that universities are supposed to be safe space. You're not supposed to be challenged. Yeah. I mean, the, <laughs> the whole point of, of education is to challenge your, your present beliefs. You don't have mm -hmm. to accept them. Well, in my classes, I don't know, I guess one third of my s freshman students really like me. Hmm. And they go on, and, and I've been lucky. Some of them take my advanced classes and go on and get PhDs, and I've got, oh, seven or eight professors now who were my oh, uh, undergraduate so students. Yeah. And maybe one-third of the kids hate me <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, I favor uh, capitalism and greed and, mm -hmm. um, I don't know. Um, uh, exploitation. Uh, ta exploitation and, and charging high prices and profit Price gouging. Price all gouging, of all of that. And then maybe one third of them are sort of, eh, they're, they're neutral yeah. because freshman classes are usually required. Okay. So they sort of have, to, not that pe anyone's pointing a gun at them and say you have to take <laughs> the course, but if you want to graduate, you have to take uh, Economics 101 or something. Mm -hmm. uh, now in my advanced classes, all the students are, have, uh, uh, take me voluntarily. Plus I'm very lucky at Loyola, I've got four or five colleagues who were all free market, which oh, is very that's, unusual. Yeah, that's good. So if a kid took one of them for his freshman class and comes to me for an advanced class, he's already self-selected as being open to free enterprise. Yeah. So uh, in my advanced classes, pretty much there's, I wouldn't say total agreement on every jot and tittle, mm -hmm. but uh, by and large uh, agreement on the part of most of them for most issues. So uh, it, it greatly varies. Are you the only Austrian there? Like you said, more no, free market guy, no, but are uh, they like, like, you know, hardcore praxeology? Well, uh, I would say there are five of us. Bill Barnett and I have co-authored many an article, and he is a staunch anarcho-capitalist Austrian. Mm -hmm. uh, then we have Stuart Wood, who was a former student of Israel Kirzner, who was a famous Austrian, and he is also an Austro-libertarian. Then we have John Lavendis, who is uh, sort of an Austro-sympathetic -symp to it. Okay, yeah. And uh, Leo Krasnijan, uh, very staunch free enterprises, but uh, Leo is more a little public choice, and uh, John is um, sort of half Austrian and half not. <coughs> but by and large, it's a very friendly department, mm -hmm. and um, we're all very free enterprise and all very libertarian, and I think all anarchists. Um, uh, and some of them are a little uh, into Austrianism, and some are a lot into Austrianism, which is very unusual. Because most of the places I've taught at, I was the odd man out. My mm -hmm. colleagues would tell students not to take Block because he's a crackpot, yeah. he's a nut, <laughs> sort of like Ron Paul is a crazy uncle. Mm -hmm. uh, so that wasn't as um, nice uh, <laughs> a situation as, as the one that I now have. Yeah. You feel like it's getting better? Well... Uh, we lost Dan D'Amico. Uh, he was a former student of mine who was a, a colleague of mine, and then he went off to Brown University, which is a very prestigious mm -hmm. uh, place, so we're all uh, very happy. It's a feather in all of our caps, especially Dan's. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't know if it's improving. Well, it, it disimproved or it unimproved when Dan left us, yeah. but uh, by and large, uh, it, it's a uh, steady state. We have the same people for the last couple of years, and uh, we send people off to graduate school, 
and uh, they come out with PhDs and start teaching as well. So it's yeah, very so it's uh, spreading the message. Spreading the message, very gratifying. Because yeah, you, you've been in this for years now, the whole movement. Like you were, uh, uh, Murray Rothbard made you an anarchist, right? You he an made anarchist. me an anarchist, but the person who made me a libertarian was Ayn Rand, mm -hmm. and this is around 1962. Okay, yeah. So it's been a what quite happened? A while. What <laughs> happened was uh, I was a socialist of the Bernie Sanders variety mm -hmm. at Brooklyn College, and Ayn Rand came to speak and. And I came to boo and hiss her because she favored free freedom, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and as a good uh, you know commie type. Uh, yeah, I freedom opposed. for the capitalists, but what yeah. about the working class? Right, the uh, workers. You know, yeah. we. Uh, so I came and booed and hissed her <laughs> along with three thousand other students, and at the end of the um, lecture, they announced that the Ayn Rand Study Club or whatever the group was that had invited her was having a lunch in her honor, and anyone could come even if you disagreed. And I wanted to boo and hiss her and convert her to socialism because <laughs> socialism was the way to go. And uh, when I got there, there was this big long table. Ayn Rand was sitting at the head of it, and, and there were maybe 50 people on each side, so 100 people. And next to her were Brandon and uh, Greenspan and uh, uh, a bunch of other of her uh, yeah, chief lieutenants. Her circle, so. And her inner circle. Yeah. And I was sort of relegated to the foot of the table, way out <laughs> the other end. And I turned to my neighbor and I said, what's this? Capitalism is no good. Socialism is great. And he said, well, I don't really know that much about it, but the people who do are at the other end of the table. So I marched over there. <laughs> I was a chutzpahnik, pushy. Still am. No, yeah, I was going to say. A little bit. <laughs> I don't know you that well, but you know, just your <laughs> reputation. <laughs> so I stuck my head between Ayn's and Nathan's, and I said, there's a socialist here who wants to debate someone on socialism and capitalism. And they said, who is it? I said, me. And I was maybe 20, 21 at the time. I think I was a senior in college. And I don't know, Brandon was maybe 35 and ran 55 or so. They were adults. I was a kid. Right. And I said, I, uh, me, I want to debate. And Brandon was very, very gentle and very, very nice with me. He said, look, I'll, there's no room for you to sit here, but I'll come to the other end of the table and I'll sit with you on two conditions. One, you uh, promise not to let this conversation lapse with this one shot. And two, you read two books that I'll recommend to you. Well, the two books were Atlas Shrugged by Ayn Rand, uh, by Ayn Rand mm -hmm. and Economics in One Lesson by Henry Hazlitt. Oh, those two good introductions. Magnificent books. I yeah. use them in my intro classes now. Oh, nice. Yeah. And uh, I didn't let the conversation lapse, but I went to his house, to Ayn Rand's house, and, and after four or five sessions, I was converted. I was uh, a limited government, Randian type. But the problem was uh, with the Nathaniel Brandon Institute, I would go to the seminars, and it was sort of cultish. Uh -huh. did, uh, they, did they force you to smoke after they converted <laughs> you? Or did they want you to start smoking cigarettes? No, 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 they didn't force you to smoke, but they <laughs> certainly encouraged smoking. The smoking was rational. Uh, uh, yes. There was this, uh, Murray Rothbard had this um, play, uh, Mozart was a Red. Oh, yes. You yes, must see that, yeah. audience. I think it's on YouTube, yeah. You must see that, as <laughs> you know, sort of a, a Rothbardian takedown of the Rand movement. Not subtle whatsoever. Not <laughs> you know exactly what it's well, about. Well, <laughs> Murray's middle name was not subtle. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the very opposite. Yeah. <laughs> no, uh, Murray, and I try to emulate him, was more like a, you know, a smack and a kisser or something. Mm -hmm. Not subtle. So uh, what happened is I... Like, if you ask the question at the end of the lectures, and the question was like an easy one, like, well, Miss Rand, on page 402 you said this. Could you please elaborate on that? You know, she would take that question uh, happily and elaborate. But if you said on page 402 you said this, and on page 706 you said that, and the yeah. contradiction, she would tell you to get out. Oh, yeah, A is A. She didn't have any you out. I mean, yeah. it, it was... You know, and yeah, that is well almost Marxist. Uh, almost, in a way, like I mean, it, it wasn't cool. Yeah. Uh, so I would sort of leave in disgust. But then they were they were the only free market people I knew. Remember, Brooklyn, New York, <laughs> everything was yeah, this is socialist. Yeah. So I'd come back and I'd sort of go back and forth, um, uh, approach avoidance, schizophrenia. I don't know mm -hmm. what you call it. And then I was at Columbia in graduate school, and Larry Moss, and his roommate Jerry Wallows. Uh, said, you've got to meet this guy, Murray Rothbard. He's a free market anarchist. Remember, I was a Randian at that time. Yeah, sorry, anarchist. what year was this? When uh, you this was 66, maybe. 66, yeah. uh, I met them in maybe 62. Okay. Uh, maybe 63, I yeah. forget. Uh, but when you went to go meet Murray, that was... Well, that was 65 or 66. 66. Okay. And, but when I first met Larry, Larry was in my class at Columbia, and, and Jerry was his roommate. 
And they would say, you must meet Bowie Rothbard. I said, no, he's an anarchist. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah. So I don't want to meet him. But finally... <laughs> like any good Randian. Just right, to, yeah, right. Like down. any good Randian. Although I wasn't a real good Randian because I saw the cultishness of them. Mm -hmm. And a good Randian would, wouldn't think of it as cultish. No, it's got to be rational. Anything no Rand rational did was, yeah. was great. Yeah. So I finally met Murray. And uh, he converted me out of... Uh, limited government in about 10 minutes. Yeah. He used uh, the Henry Hazlitt argument about you know the weeding out process of inefficiency. Mm -hmm. He said, well, why wouldn't it work for police? And I couldn't think of a great reason. And why wouldn't it work for firemen? Why wouldn't it work for courts, armies? And that was it. Uh, to get to Austrianism took me much longer. Mm. Uh, I was reading His Man, Economy, and the State, and Mises, Human Action, but I had an intellectual investment in mainstream economics. Okay, yeah. Gary Becker was my professor, and I was sort of, um, he was my mentor, and I, I was his follower. So it really took a long time for me to get into Austrianism, mm -hmm. maybe a year or two. But Murray uh, was, was magnificent. Uh, the only problem with Murray is he gets stomach cramps, because he keeps you laughing oh. hour <laughs> after hour. <laughs> He's just so funny, making fun of everybody. It was, but apart from that, uh, <laughs> I love Murray. <laughs> yeah. This, uh, yeah, it's kind of unfortunate that he did pass away in 95, right? Like the yeah. year right before the internet and then yeah. Ron Paul. I could only imagine him, you know, out giving lectures now. On well, I'm sure he's up there somewhere cackling away oh, yeah. at, at the folly of human beings <laughs> and sort of rooting us on to, oh, of course, yeah. to do better. That's, uh, do you have any stories of Murray Rothbard that you know you've never told anybody else, like on, in like an interview? Because you know, I need some good, you know, <laughs> juicy stuff. People want to watch this video. Well, Murray was uh, Murray was the sort of people that my parents told me to stay away from. Oh, really? Because Murray would drink alcohol. So he did drink. He drank alcohol, and I think he smoked cigarettes, which, which is very bad wow, for yeah, my I never parents. Seen, yeah. And uh, he stayed up late at night. He would that go to bed at like 5 or 6 in the morning <laughs> and get up at 1 or 2 in the afternoon, which for my parents, you know, middle class types, this was horrible. Yeah, horrible stuff. Uh, so that's one problem with Murray <laughs> for my parents. And, and he sort of sucked us all in because, you know, we, we wanted to be with Murray. Mm -hmm. So we would go to bed later and later and uh, stay up. I remember one time Roger Garrison came to uh, Murray's living room and... Uh, it was me and Murray and maybe Jerry O'Driscoll and other people into Money Macro. I forget exactly who was there. And uh, Roger came at around 9 o'clock. And R Roger was from Alabama or Missouri or some, you know, not from New York City. Mm -hmm. And at around 11, Roger starts making, like, to move, to leave because, yeah, like you know, it's 11 o'clock. And, and, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't want to overstay his welcome. Yeah. So... Roger is sort of hinting that he should go. And Murray is saying, what? You just got here. <laughs> you know? And what Roger was going to do is um, talk about his uh, way of uh, putting Austrian business cycle theory into diagrams, which was totally new at the time. Mm -hmm. He was the first guy that really did it. Well, not the first, but uh, he really did it up great. Yeah. I mean, Hayek did it also, and other people did it as well. And Roger was amazed uh, that, uh, you know, and, and finally, Roger stayed until 2 or 3 in the morning. <laughs> he was sort of probably a little droopy-eyed because yeah. he wasn't used to... Uh, that's still an early night, too. Yeah, 3, three o'clock, yeah, the, the night is young. Yeah. But eventually, Roger punked out because, you know, he wasn't used to <laughs> staying up till 5. <laughs> yeah. So I, I guess that's one story. Another one is um, Murray loved to play Risk. Hmm. Uh, Risk is a board game yeah. where you try to take over the take world. Over the world, yeah. And what Murray would say is, only we anarchists could play this with abandon because everyone else really wants to take over the world. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We don't. So we realize it's, it's just a game. You right. Know, it's, <laughs> once you start doing it in real life, it becomes a serious problem. Murray liked jazz music. He would uh, go to jazz places to um, uh, have dinner. Mm -hmm. I remember one time, this is in the early days of pornography, uh, I Am Curious Yellow or some. Nowadays, you wouldn't even call it hardcore, but Murray went to the movies, <laughs> and Murray likes to radicalize people. Mm. And uh, so a woman is sort of half taking off her clothes, and she Murray's yelling, take it all off. <laughs> <laughs> and Joey, his wife, is poking him with her elbow ah, and saying, Murray, really shut up, shut up. <laughs> Another story is um, Murray also liked uh, Handel's Messiah. 
And as you know, in Handel's Messiah, there, there's the bass, there's the baritone, the tenor, the soprano, okay. uh, different voices. And Murray would sing all the voices. <laughs> <laughs> and Joey, his wife, would, you know, long-suffering uh, <laughs> wife, would say, Murray, you, you're not supposed to sing all the, the, uh, all the voices. It's interesting, yeah. Uh, well, what, what's your writing schedule like? Do you stay up all night like Murray? Well, let me tell you another story. I, when I first started writing, what I would do is I would keep track of how many pages I would write. And a page was like uh, 300 words. So if I did five pages, that would be 1,500 words. Mm -hmm. I would sort of say, well, that was pretty good. Yeah, nonfiction, right? Oh, yeah, so yeah, I'm, that's a lot of work. My critics say I'm, I write fiction, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> I write nonfiction. Yeah. So uh, five pages was pretty good. And yeah. every once in, not every day did I reach five. You know, sometimes two or three, sometimes nothing. Mm -hmm. And every once in a while I would do better, 10 or 15. One day I got up real early. I don't know, eight in the morning. For me, it was real early. That's it. <laughs> and I must have worked until two the next morning, and I did 23 pages. This is my best. Yeah. So I call up Murray, and I said, well, I'm, you know, a little uh, competitiveness here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. I, I would never dare compare the quality, but at least the quantity of words I could compare. So I called Murray, and I said, well, you know, how many words or pages do you write in a day? And Murray goes, rah, rah, who, who keeps track? <laughs> and, but I push. I'm, I'm very pushy, and yeah. I kept pushing. Murray was very tolerant of me. I kept, I'll tell you another story in, in a minute about pushiness. Uh, so finally, I, I get it out of him, and he says, eight pages an hour. An hour? Eight so pages an hour. It was on a typewriter without the internet. Right. Well, I was also on a typewriter, so oh, yeah, that, that was equal. But not, not but eight an hour. I don't do eight pages an hour. Now, a good typist who does 100, page, 100 words a minute could do more than eight pages an hour. Mm -hmm. But Murray is creating stuff. Yeah. He's so in my best day, I did roughly three of his hours, and it took me, I don't know, yeah. 15 hours so Murray uh, w was very fast. Uh, another story about Murray is when I first met him and I started reading his stuff, I realized I was in the presence of the Mozart of economics. I'm a big mm -hmm. Mozart fan or the Bach, uh, yeah, Bach it's of it's economics. He was, he, he was a man. Mm -hmm. And I was this young punk kid. I mean, <laughs> I'd never done anything, and yet he wanted to be friendly with me. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to be worthy of his friendship and my way of being worthy of his friendship was to be to criticize him so i would come up with five criticisms and he was very gentle with me <laughs> i was lucky rand was gentle with me yeah. uh, uh brandon was gentle with me at I least murray didn't kick you out or anything no he didn't yeah, kick me out no no and i try to be gentle to my students because i'm trying to pass along the baton that was passed along to me and not just mm -hmm. by murray but by ayn rand and and brandon so I, I try to be gentle with my students. And he just wanted to be my friend, and I couldn't understand that. <laughs> but now, you know, I had the same experience. You know, with younger libertarians, I just want to be their friend, and, and mm -hmm. somehow they can't get that through their head that I want to be their friend because they put me on this pedestal. Oh, of course, yeah. So I don't know. It's uh, it's a problem, but I try. You know, like Murray would always make everyone call him Murray, mm -hmm. not Professor Longthorn. So I get people to call me Walter, and, and they're very uncomfortable doing it. Mm -hmm. But I, I emulate Murray in, in many ways, and that's one of the ways. Well, yeah. That's, I don't certainly, uh, uh, when you first came in, the first few times I met you, of course, it's almost like just default to be kind of, you know, put you on this pedestal and kind of be, you know, a little insecure. Then, you know, you warm up, and you realize, yeah, you are just a friendly guy, yeah. and you refuse to be called Professor Block or Dr. Block, even though you're a doctor. If I was a doctor, I'd be... I'd make everyone call me doctor. Well, everybody, <laughs> everybody I know has got a PhD. Yeah, well, well, I guess that's everybody. the other thing, too. The market's so saturated. <laughs> well, not everybody, but uh, all the people well, at universities yeah, have a PhD, yeah. so it doesn't really mean that yeah. much. It, it, it just means that you had a you know, minimal IQ of about 100 <laughs> and hard work ethic. Mm -hmm. I think that's what gets you the PhD. Yeah, being good with your professors. Because uh, certainly with Murray, he had... he took forever for him to get his PhD, right? Well, Arthur Burns didn't want to let Murray get his PhD yeah. because Arthur Burns uh, took a great dislike to Murray because, you know, Murray, Arthur Burns was head of the Fed. <laughs> you know what Murray's view of the Fed is. Of course. Not yeah. too positive. So uh, the only way Murray could get his PhD was when Arthur Burns went off to uh, Nixon. Uh, the, to administration, yeah. the Nixon administration, and he left Columbia 
Uh, by the way, I have a lot in common with Murray. We both got PhDs at Columbia. Mm-hmm. We're both Jewish. We both married Christian girls. Uh-huh. Um, both kind of atheists as well, clearly Jewish both atheists, by... Yes, by both atheists, yeah. uh, both uh, austro libertarians um. Now, if you smoke and drank, though, you're c- no, you're uh, clean cut, right? Yes, yeah. yes. I, I, <laughs> Diet Coke is my... <laughs> Diet Coke, is, that's your sin. <laughs> right. <laughs> your aspartame. <laughs> right, right. But I didn't realize where he smoked, though. Was that just like early in his life? Well, or? maybe just a little. And just a little, yeah, I don't maybe at a party. He wasn't... Not, not a big smoker. Yeah, because I say I've never really seen him. Yeah. Even that that one picture of him with the typewriter, he's got pe- like a pen or a pencil sticking uh, out. At, at first, you think it's a cigarette. Well, you know, I'm not even sure that he smoked. I think maybe mm-hmm. once in a while. I'm I'm not sure, but yeah, other like people around him smoked. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, it was so the it was 60s, sort of the, the living room crowd. Uh, they they were up. dissolute. Uh, yeah. They would drink whiskey. I mean, <laughs> unheard of. <laughs> Parties. <laughs> right. Par- they were party animals. Yeah. Murray was a party animal. Oh, see, that's yeah. That would have been great to have been around for that. Yeah. Party with Murray Rothbard. Yeah. Hmm. So, uh, well, we could keep talking about uh, some stories if you have any more. Yo, you were going to tell another story about. Uh, well, no, I, I have a question for you. Your punchiness when you re- when you first read Man, Economy, and State. You know, going through because I I once showed this to like a hardcore leftist. I'm like, okay, we're going right down to the basics here. You know, because he builds up the whole framework and it's all it's just irrefutably true. And like every single line he's trying to refute, like, well, that's not always true. That's not necessarily true. And this, like, no, 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 no. So, you know, the, the way you were, and also, you know, your investment with mainstream economics, when you read Man, Economy, and State, or anything by Murray, did you always try to, like, question it or find some argument against what you were reading? Or were you yes. just kind of. No, yeah, that yeah. was, I was like your friend, uh, mm-hmm. being critical, not just economics, but. Um, libertarian theory uh, th- there are areas by the way I must have maybe 10 or 15 articles published where I criticize Murray hmm. well yeah you had the, the slavery the selling yourself uh, voluntary slave. slavery yeah. uh, Murray and I disagreed mm-hmm. with um, on abortion we agree disagreed on mm-hmm. uh, we uh, we disagreed on some technical issues in economics uh, but he was very you know never came with a million miles of saying, well, I don't want to be your friend or never darken my oh, doorstep right. again or right. anything like that. Uh, Probably values it. It values it, yeah, because it's... Possibly, cr- yeah. <laughs> possibly, yeah. yeah. No, no, he did. Yeah. And, you know, uh, a lot of my publications are uh, co-authored with students of mine. And they'll write a term paper, you know, saying minimum wage is no good or free trade is good or something like that, which mm-hmm. they got from me. Mm-hmm. But they put it in their own voices, and then I add to it, edit it, and co-author it. Every once in a while, I'll get a student who writes an essay saying Block is wrong on everything, or, or not <laughs> everything, but Block but, is know. wrong on this issue. Yeah. And I'm very proud of myself because on those issues, now obviously I can't co-author an article with a student who attacks me from 180 degrees, yeah, right. but what I do is I try to get them published. And I've had maybe 70, 75 of my student term papers published in referee journals. And about five or six of them are direct attacks on me. Hmm. Now, some t- and, and what I do is I try to help them get it published because they're not really good at publishing. And publishing in referee journals is sort of like the, uh, I don't know, the feather in your cap in academia. It's the way you get promoted to full professor or the way you get tenure or things like that. Mm-hmm. So to have an undergraduate paper published in a referee journal is like a, a big, big deal, boost, or a yeah. big deal, in, at least in academia. And I'm very proud of myself that I treat my students the way Murray treated me, mm-hmm. namely help them mm-hmm. and, and be easy with them and be gentle with them. So uh, now, some of the, uh, the students who attack me and then get published, I do write a refutation, a rejoinder, uh, criticizing them, which is only fair. Yeah. I mean, if they're going to attack <laughs> you can't me let them get away with no, that. No, can't <laughs> get it right, right. Uh, but at least I help them, and I, I don't. I'm not angry with them or you know anything remotely resembling that. Well, um, uh, this is the dead air when I can't think of any more questions because uh, I have, I've got tons of stuff about your book. Oh, like well, just, then uh, let's get to the book. But I was having such a fun conversation oh, with well. you know, these old memories and everything. Uh, well, yeah, well, you, your book on you know privatizing oceans, rivers, and lakes and all that. Um, I guess my question is, uh, I guess, well, I haven't read the, the whole book, so... Um, Maybe you do address this, but I do remember, I think you were on Tom Woods and you were talking about how you thought, I think lakes would just be owned by a single like person rather than portioned up. And 
I was wondering what the rationale behind that was. Like, if I if, in a city, the way I'd look at it, like in a in a city, there's a road. You know, there's a road, and maybe it's the or the sidewalk. The people, like you know, there's a business and then they own the piece in front of them, and you know they maybe you know have a co-op where you know make sure this road is maintained. Would that could that same thing not happen with rivers? Like if there's you know the Bow River goes through Calgary, Alberta, and maybe it's just it's owned instead of by one company, it's owned by several people and maybe they you know a co-op or something. Well, Murray used to talk about the technological unit. Okay. In his um, um, essay on um, air pollution, uh, and what he means by a technological unit is let's take a road first okay uh, we're on Barad Street here mm -hmm. now Barad Street has got I don't know how many people have houses alongside of it uh, say 3,000 pick a number yeah. who knows I mean, it's a long street Barad yeah. Street and suppose we were to privatize Barad Street and and when you think of Barad Street think of a river which yeah. sort of looks like Barad Street long and thin mm -hmm. There's probably a river right underneath there. There might well be, for <laughs> all we know. I don't know about that, but maybe there is. Okay, so one way to divide Barad Street up would be, let's say you own 1252 Barad Street, this little building here, mm -hmm. and now, and I don't know how wide the building is, uh, maybe it's frontage 100 feet. So you own 100 feet of Barad Street and half of it, because uh, people on the other side of the street own the other half. Okay, yeah. So... If we have 3,000 people have frontage on Barad Street, we now have 6,000 owners. Mm -hmm. And the problem with that is that if everybody charges a little bit of money as people go by Barad Street, like mm -hmm. in a, when I parked, I had to put money in the meter. Yeah. But there's traffic that goes by your little patch. Yeah. You, you own this uh, 1252 Barad Street, and uh, your little patch, 100 feet long and, I don't know, two or three lanes wide, and you charge a penny. And every time somebody goes by, they have to put a penny in there. Yeah. And, and now if you want to go the whole length of Barad Street, uh, there's uh, 1,500 people, it would be... It'd be quicker to walk and just give away your It'd be quicker to walk. Pennies. It'd be yeah. quicker to crawl. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that would not be a technological unit. Okay. And what Murray means by a technological unit is all of Barad Street, at least all of Barad Street, mm -hmm. maybe all the streets in, in downtown Vancouver. That's another issue. But at mm -hmm. least... A whole Barad Street. So if you want to go from one end one way to the other, you don't have to keep putting a penny or two cents or five cents in to everybody's uh, collection box as you go by. Mm. So a much better way to privatize Barad Street, rather than uh, dividing it into three thousand little bits, would be everybody. Let's say uh, to make it simple, everybody gets one three thousandth, one three thousandth mm -hmm. of Barad Street. So we now have. A, a, a corporation, sorry Bernie, a corporation, yeah, a good kind, <laughs> a good yeah. corporation, uh, the Broad Street Corporation, which has 3,000 shares, and each of the owners, like you, have one share. And now it's a corporation, and you elect the board of directors, and the board of directors might say, well, you know, we want to have it a freeway, because uh, a lot of people uh, who have their uh, businesses on the side of Broad Street would like easy traffic flow. Uh, or they, you know, sort of like Walmart doesn't charge anything uh, for parking there, mm -hmm. or for going in and out of Walmart. Yeah. Walmart so the Walmart, uh, the Broad Street Corporation might make it a freebie. Yeah. Maybe not. It's up to them, and we'd have co competition with the next street over, uh, uh, kind of a thing, Burlow Street or, or whatever it is. So uh, what Murray is talking about is a technological unit. So now let's move from. Broad Street to the Mississippi River. Well, Mississippi River must have, I don't know, 100,000 people <laughs> on, on either yeah. side of it. And uh, one way to privatize it would be to make a Mississippi River Corporation where 100,000 people have one share each. And that is if you went by uh, the stuff on the, side of the, on, the, on the side of the Mississippi River. You don't have to do it because you see, the, the libertarian view is based on Locke and Rothbard and Hans Hoppe, who've done great work on uh, homesteading. homesteading. Yeah. Homesteading would be, be the key. And the only reason we're picking people on the side of the Mississippi River is because we assume that if they're on the side of the Mississippi River, they, they use the Mississippi River. Mm. 
but it need not be true. There might be, uh, I had a boat that I carried stuff, and I didn't have any land on any side of the Miss Mississippi River, yeah. <coughs> and therefore I should, you know, have a, a little bit of the Mississippi River because I, Need for the travel. last 30 years, I had my boat going up and down mm -hmm. on the Mississippi River. So these are very, very ticklish technical problems of, you know, how do you privatize it? Yeah, because you, know, you don't want government just handing out the contract. To and, and you don't want government uh, auctioning it off yeah. either, because if government auctions it off, then they get the money. Yeah, that's the other thing. Why do they deserve money? They're a bunch yeah. of criminals. Uh -huh. uh, as Lysander Spooner would say, criminals and murderers and thieves. Mm -hmm. So we shouldn't auction it off. We should get as close to homesteading as we can. Now, you had the same problem in the Soviet Union when they went belly up and they had to get rid of the collectivized farms and the factories. And mm -hmm. BRIC, right here in British Columbia, BCRIC, British Columbia Resources Investment Corporation, mm -hmm. um, what happened, you had an NDP government. This was in the 60s, maybe? Yeah, I think so. We were just actually just talking about the NDP huh. government before. But okay. uh, well, yeah. in the 60s, yeah. the NDP I government got BRIC, British Columbia Resource Investment Corporation. They had a whole bunch of forests and lumber mills and mines and this and that and the mm -hmm. other. And it was government crown corporation. Mm -hmm. And then um, Bill Van Der Zam came in, mm -hmm. who was not NDP, it was more free enterprise. It wasn't as free enterprise as we libertarians would like it, but on this issue he was pretty good, yeah. and he, he said, well, let's privatize it. And he gave out, what is it, five shares to every citizen of British Columbia. Yeah, so. Now, it wasn't as good a privatization as we would like because they, they, you couldn't own more than 2% of the shares or something, yeah, something like, that. like that, but it was a move in the right direction based sort of on homesteading. Well, not based on homesteading because, you see, it was not based on homesteading. It, if it was based on homesteading, what you would try to do is you'd have a God's eye view where God is all-knowing and knows exactly whose land went into this forest and who, who uh, homesteaded the forest first and who, whose taxes went into this mine, mm -hmm. which would so be virtually impossible for yeah. us human beings to know. Yeah. So as a sort of a, a rough approximation, it, it wasn't a good approximation. It probably should have been the richer you are, the more shares you get. Yeah. Because <laughs> the more taxes you paid for this stuff. Exactly. But right. what the heck, it was politically infeasible to do it that way. Right, especially in B.C. <laughs> especially in B.C. So, you know, if there was a libertarian government that had power, that's the way they would do it. Pardon the expression, libertarian government, it's sort of a little kind A little bit of an oxymoron. But, but what it, the heck, you know, works, uh, yeah. we're just speaking loosely here. Yeah. A libertarian-oriented government. Yeah. A classical liberal government updated for the 21st century. Right. <laughs> they would have done it uh, maybe a little bit better. But even they wouldn't know whose taxes went where. Mm -hmm. So uh, to have a, um, uh, a rough approximation or, you know, just get it in the private hands, it was at least a step in the right direction. So I would advocate and did advocate in this book with my co-author. Uh, the Highways was a single author. The um, Water Capitalism was co-author. Peter uh, Nelson was my co-author there. And uh, that would be the way we had advocated. Well, let me tell you how I got a hold of Peter Nelson. It would have been the LRC ad, right? No, <laughs> well, see, what happened is I wanted to write a book about privatizing water. And I'm not really an engineer. I'm, I'm just sort of a BS economist. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't know about tides and... and Water pressure and, and, and all storms. Sort of I, that just storms you go on, but uh, that's a question I'll, well, I'll ask later. All but, sorts uh, of things about water that I don't know. Mm -hmm. So I think it was on LouRockwell.com. Is I said, well, here's a problem: some lake in in Florida where you had uh, uh, what's that underwater uh, thing? Um, uh, oh, yeah, go ahead. Aquifer. Aquifer. Okay. Aquifer. Yeah. It's right in the yeah. title of the book, but I forgot <laughs> the name. I'm getting senile here. Yeah. When I tell my colleagues I'm getting senile, they, they assure me, no, 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 you're not getting <laughs> senile. You already are. <laughs> um, uh, there was some problem with a lake and an aquifer in, in Florida, and, and, and um, what I wrote is, you know, I, I want to co-author for this book, and um, here is a problem with this aquifer lake in Florida, and how would private enterprise deal with it? And uh, I'll pick whoever writes me the best essay. So four or five people wrote essays on that. Yeah. And I said, look, if I don't pick you, you're free to publish it. So you're not really yeah, risking yeah. a lot. And four or five people wrote things on that, and, and his was the best. And 
he's really good. He's a, a Rothbardian free enterprise Austrian engineer of water. That's perfect. Yeah, uh, oil, you li for better li liquids, yeah. uh, water, stuff like that. And, and he and I got along very, very well. And there's our book. And we got along so well that we're now doing the book on space. And again, he's much better than I am on gravitational thing and weightlessness and yeah, all sorts a lot of, of the science physics there, and yeah. science that I'm really a little weak on, mm -hmm. whereas I'm more firm on, you know, I don't know, uh, suppose Mars gets, um, what is it when, when you um, get an atmosphere from Mars? What's that called? Um, ah, can't think of it. I mean, atmosphere reading? Like no, I'm not crea sure. creating an atmosphere. Oh, like, um, like geoengineering or something, something like terraforming? Terraforming, yeah. uh, terraforming, yeah. right. Uh, I'm more, you see, that's a problem of public goods because everyone would benefit if you had a, an atmosphere on Mars and how yeah. would that work with property rights. So I sort of start that chapter and then he comments on it and then I, we bat it back and forth until we're finished with the chapter. Oh. But he's more better at, you know, weightlessness and, and what about, you know, getting to Jupiter and, you know, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So I have a, like a real good co-author. Yeah, no, it sounds like it's going to be great. Like, that might be the most popular one. Like, I know, th I love roads and highways, but I, for some reason, it, you know, the status go, oh, what about the roads? And the libertarians are like, who cares about roads? We've got central banks and wars. But <laughs> well, no, to roads me, are like, important. Yeah, yeah, roads, it kind of solves, in a lot of ways, like immigration as well. Because, you know, if, uh, I know right now, there's a big issue with refugees in Canada. I'm sure the same with the states. And if we had uh, private roads and, you know, the government brings in, you know, refugee, refugees, you know, they're in the government building. They can't really leave if they're surrounded by a bunch of private roads that haven't consented, that, like there's no contracts, and so. There is that, uh, by the way, that's another issue where Murray and I disagree. Although Murray has written several things on immigration, and I call it Rothbard One, who is an open borders person. But then under the influence of Hans Hoppe, who I'm a big fan of, mm -hmm. Rothbard Two is anti-open borders. And Hans Hoppe, who I regard as uh, one of Murray's chief followers, chief lieutenants, mm -hmm. uh, along with me and oh, five or six others. One of these little punks that came and criticized. <laughs> yes, yes. Oh, th let, let me tell you a story of Murray and Hans. Murray used to um, predicate or defend or um, see as the root of libertarianism natural law. And Murray's written about natural law and how it defends libertarianism, and it's sort of the basis or the, the, the genesis of libertarianism. Along comes this young pup, Hans, mm -hmm. who when I first met was, I don't know, 25 or, you know, young kid. Yeah. And he has this very, very different way of justifying libertarianism, and it's called argument from argument. Yeah, the, the, the argumentation ethics. Ar or argumentation yeah. ethics. Yeah. His idea roughly is the, the only way you can settle the truth of anything is by arguing. Mm -hmm. But what, what is required for there to be an argument? Guess what? Private property. Yeah. So therefore, uh, the private property is predicated on uh, uh, the argument from uh, argumentation ethics. Totally different justification for the libertarian non-aggression principle mm -hmm. than Murray's. And what is Murray's reaction? Is I mean. Hans was 25, Murray was 55 or so. I'm yeah, not Murray sure. written Ethics of Liberty. Yeah, and, yeah. W which in Ethics of Liberty had this stuff about natural law. Natural, yeah. And if he was like Ayn Rand, he would have banished <laughs> Hans from the movement. Yeah, physically removed him from right. the system. Yeah. But instead he said, I was wrong and Hans was right. I mean, mm -hmm. isn't that magnificent? Yeah. Well, what do you think of that argument, though? Do you think well, Hans, I'm a big yeah. hoppy and... Yeah, okay, so yeah, I, I, this, I know there's a little debate. Oh, and, yes, yeah. David Friedman didn't like it, and, and a few other people yeah, didn't uh, Robert like it. Murphy, yeah, Robert P. Murphy. Robert Murphy didn't yeah. like it, uh, and I respect Robert Murphy often, greatly. Mm -hmm. I think Bob Murphy is a great guy. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I stand with Hans on, not stand with Rand, <laughs> stand with Hans, <laughs> Hans yeah. on, on this issue. Um, but that is a, a very divisive issue. Um, where I'm an open borders person, and the latest thing that there's this guy, the bionic mosquito. Oh yes, yeah, who he, is? I'm Lou Yeah. He he just sort of burst from nowhere, and obviously that's not his name; it's a pseudonym. Mm -hmm. For a while, I thought it might be Lou Rockwell writing no, and no, ghost writing, but no, no it's uh, no, it is no, somebody it's else. A different guy. Yeah. I know who it is, and, and I'm yeah. not at liberty to say because exactly. he asked me not to. Yeah. But he sort of burst from nowhere, 
and he's writing this magnificent libertarian stuff. Mm -hmm. But on, on immigration, he is a Hoppian or a Rothbardian too. And the, uh, this, you know, right before I left, that's what I'm writing now on that issue. I'm sort of taking a break from space and, and getting into this. Uh, I was starting to write my essay on why the bionic mosquito and Hans are wrong on this. And the argument that they now use is Cologne. Oh, yeah. Cologne, Europe, Germany. Yeah, yeah. Where uh, Germany let in a lot of people from Syria and from, I don't know, Pakistan or other Arab uh, yeah, just, Muslim yeah. countries. And Sweden also. And what happens, you get 100 men and they'll surround a woman and they'll molest her. And isn't this horrible? And, and therefore... Isn't the open borders position, the one that I espouse, isn't that responsible for this? Mm -hmm. And aren't I aiding and abetting rape mm -hmm. or, or molestation, uh, stuff like that? And my answer is, and I'm just sort of turning it around in my own mind, so I'm happy to share it with you. Oh, this, perfect. I'll be publishing this soon. Ah, uh, you got this here first. Yes, yeah, there we go. There's my scoop. <laughs> this is your scoop. Uh, you know, uh, Kant, Immanuel Kant, had this thing that categorical. No, the hypothetical and the categorical, uh, categorical imperative. Okay. So what the categorical imperative is, don't rob, don't steal, don't murder. Yeah, basic stuff. What the hypothetical imperative is, if you want a good society, don't rob. It's sort of an if-then, yeah. the hypothetical imperative. Mm -hmm. So the way I see the defense of my position against the attack from... Cologne, the Cologne attack, mm -hmm. is as follows. What, what the open borders libertarian position really is, is not a categorical imperative. It's not open the borders. It's rather, if you, let me start again. I'm, I'm sort of thinking about no, this. No, no, yeah, yeah, that <laughs> takes time. <laughs> you see, the question is, I wear my libertarian eyeglasses whenever I deal with libertarian questions, and mm -hmm. the libertarian eyeglasses are the non-aggression principle. Mm -hmm. That's it. So is this camera over here compatible with libertarianism? Well, yeah, because it's not per se invading anyone. Yeah. It, uh, is, uh, is a rapist uh, compatible with libertarianism? No, because it is invading someone. Mm -hmm. So well, what about immigration? Is it per se a violation of rights? Well, no, because I can think of counterexamples. Suppose a, a Korean or an African or a Martian comes to the middle of the Canadian Rockies where there's nobody there, mm -hmm. and uh, by helicopter or by, I don't know, uh, pole vault, somehow he gets there, and it's never been touched by human hands. I mean, the uh, BLM, Bureau of Land Management in, in the U.S., would claim the, the Colorado Rockies or the Wyoming Rockies, yeah. and the uh, Crown here would, I, I forget whether it's provincial or federal, would certainly claim what's going on in the Northwest Territories or in Upper British Columbia. Mm -hmm. But they've never homesteaded it. Yeah. They never touched foot on this uh, 100 acres. And now this guy from Mars or Africa or uh, Asia or wherever he's coming from catapults in there or gets in there with a helicopter and he starts farming. Did he violate anyone's rights? No. Mm -hmm. He didn't violate anyone's rights. He's a, the first homesteader. Now, it's true that he's violating the law. <laughs> the Canadian law says you just can't do that. You yeah. have to come through customs and yak, yak, yak. Yeah, yeah. But That's we're libertarians. We don't care about that. We care about did he violate the non-aggression principle? Mm -hmm. Another point on, on my side is, the, you know, uh, babies, how they're uh, born? They come from the stork. Yeah, of course. Yeah, right. This is child friendly show. Yeah, Santa right. Claus. They come from the stork, and, and uh, the stork has blue um, a blanket for a boy baby and a pink blanket for a girl baby. Right. Don't give me this crap about intercourse. Uh, that's not how it happens. It's a stork. Yeah. Well, well, well you, we, I just, uh, we forgot to trigger warning our audience. Oh, though, right, because we right. said oh, male and female. Sex, like right, it, yes. I think the child you know, right. decides yes, well, once they that, get older what well, gender. <laughs> you know, we're, we're probably violating feminist sensibilities here, oh, so yeah. I, I appreciate the trigger warning. <laughs> okay, then now there's this country called Storkovia. Okay. It's another country. That's where babies come from. Okay. They're, they, they're born in Storkovia, and the stork brings them here. Is this a violation of rights? Well, if you're... A, not an open borders person, when you have a baby, you just had an immigrant. He came from Storkovia, mm -hmm. but he's an immigrant. So how dare you? 
you should go to the government. In other words, I'm trying to make a reductio ad absurdum of the uh, closed borders libertarian case. Yeah. If the closed borders people were s uh, logically consistent, they would have rules about uh, birth. Do you think that in kind of an anarcho-capitalist society there might be, though? Because it's not, not rules, but, you know, you have a bunch of people, property owners living together. They're going to have already contracts in place. And maybe well, there might if, be rules. If there's a contract that you yeah. can't have too many babies, fine. But yeah. there's no contract as far as I know now. Look, uh, the Hasidic Jews and the Mormons have 10, 12 kids. Okay, yeah, yeah. I there's mean, there are some people that have 10, 12. Yeah. Irish, I don't know who has 10. Uh, Catholics, yeah, I'm Catholic not sure. Catholic families are huge. Yeah. Protestants have smaller families. Different people have different sized families. But this issue has never been raised uh, in the immigration uh, debate. And yet, these are immigrants. You know, anything you can say about an immigrant that he's going to be on welfare, or he's going to vote, well, I can say about a baby. Oh, of course, yeah. 18 that, that, years yeah. later or 21 years later. Mm -hmm. So by having a baby, is this a per se violation of rights? No. By immigrating, is this a per se violation of rights? No. Okay, but now you get the practical problem. Suppose you get um, 10 million Chinese or 100 million Chinese. They have a billion. 100 million Chinese want to come to Canada. Okay, yeah. And with no uh, borders uh, control, they can do it. And now this will change Canada slightly. <laughs> well, <'Cause laughs> okay, how much more can it change at this well, point? Well, this will yeah. change it a lot. Well, yeah, this will, yeah. And uh, maybe there'll be Martians, and maybe we don't like Martians. Okay. So I'm getting back to my hi uh, hypothetical imperative of um, Immanuel Kant. So the open borders position that I espouse does not say let them all in. It says either let them in or privatize every square inch. Well, yeah, that's just the thing. And uh, if everything was privatized, it's then not, it not even an issue. Then yeah. it would be trespass. You see, what yeah. Hans says, he says, look, there are three ways that you can deal with international economic relations. One is the movement of goods. And in the movement of goods, when uh, we in Canada export something to Venezuela, there are two people who agree, the Canadian exporters and the Venezuelan import. Or when uh, China invests in Africa, again, there are two people, mm -hmm. the Chinese investor and the African uh, person who sells them some land to uh, you know, build a factory on. Mm -hmm. But then Han says, but in immigration, there aren't two people. It's just one guy shows up. And then what Hans is saying is, well, that's trespass. Anyone shows up in my private property without my permission, mm -hmm. he's a trespasser. So we can have closed borders on that ground. But what I say that that only works if every square inch of property is private. Mm -hmm. And there are vast tracts of Canada and the US that have never been homesteaded. It's true, some of it is submarginal land. But so what? If, if we don't want those uh, Chinese or Africans or Martians or South Americans or Mexicans or wherever they are coming from, privatize that sucker. And if you don't privatize that sucker and you're a libertarian, then you can't object to them coming in. So now to get back to the uh, rapists in uh, Cologne in Germany, we never said let them in. We said either let them in or privatize all your property. And since you didn't privatize all your property, tough on you. Yeah, this is it's this your is fault. Gone. Okay, I see, I see where you're, yeah, that's, I see the argument. That's yeah. what I'm in the midst of writing. Well, that's probably the best argument I've heard for open borders, because to be honest, I li lately, yeah, just kind of the hockey end, well, you know, yeah, closed it's borders. Horrible. It what, what those what, yeah. Syrians and Pakistanis, or whoever they are, I'm not sure who they are, yeah. they're going in and, you know, the way they treat women in, in um, uh, Egypt and those other countries is, you know, women are dirt. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're here to uh, support men or, you know, uh, to be sexual objects, and if they uh, dress with a mini skirt, then they're asking for it. I mean, you know, th th this is just nonsense. But they even attack women who are wearing the nakib or the hador or whatever yeah, it is. Whatever it is fully uh, yeah. fully uh, clothed. They still attack them. I mean, they're, they're despicable, mm -hmm. th those people. And the idea that they should come into Canada and start raping and molesting women is horrible. So I'm not saying let them in. I'm saying either let them in <laughs> or privatize everything. But if, if you knew or you had good suspicion that they would be rapists, would you, because basically saying, okay, 
obviously, the government's not going to privatize everything because it's just not going to do it. It's up on government. <laughs> it's not our fault. I know it's not our fault, but it's... Uh, we're, we're just going straight ahead and, and going with libertarian theory, and libertarian theory says... But wouldn't that be a violation of rights if the, there's reasonable suspicion that the immigrants or the refugees or whoever would... Of course it would be a violation of rights, but it wouldn't be our fault. It would be their fault. Remember, what I'm trying to do is I'm putting on my libertarian eyeglasses and I'm trying to see what's the libertarian view. And the libertarian view is either privatize or open the borders. Okay, and now you're Mr. Trudeau or you're Mr. Um, uh, Barack Obama and you're the president and you're in charge. What's your fault? Or Angela Merkel? Yeah. It's her fault. It is. Yeah. She didn't privatize everything. And if she had private, not she personally, but allowed everything to be privatized, and I'm including now, uh, you see, first of all, I talked about uh, land that had never been homesteaded. Mm -hmm. And uh, the more radical part is, well, what about uh, Stanley Park? Mm -hmm. yeah. Or uh, some other uh, roads. Roads, yeah, right. Privatize everything. Every square inch has got to be privatized. Mm -hmm. That's the libertarian view. And if you don't do it, then those rapists are your fault. Yeah. Not us libertarians, because we libertarians say it's either or. Either privatize everything, every square inch. If it moves, privatize. If it doesn't move, it privatize it. Privatize everything. And if you don't do it and you let people in, you're responsible for their raping. Hmm. Not we yeah. libertarians. Okay, I can, let's see, maybe uh, as an example, I'm not sure, maybe you can tell me this is wrong. Be almost like heroin imports. Like a lot of heroin comes into Canada and... Uh, you know, libertarian view would be okay. Well, you, you probably shouldn't do heroin, but we should end the drug war because. Well, the libertarian that, view, strictly speaking, is not that you shouldn't do heroin. Well, yeah, but yeah, that that we it have no views. We have no views as to whether you should do heroin or not. Yeah. But as non-libertarians, look, I'm a father. I have kids. I have grandchildren. I don't want my kids or my grandchildren, mm -hmm. on a personal basis, to use heroin. I think it's you know very bad. But you wouldn't be for the drug war. No, of course not. Yeah, exactly. Well, yeah, I know, obviously. So <laughs> I feel all, yeah, I've insulted you. You're going to be in this little pump now. I didn't mean to be. But, but I just, I'm just maybe, I, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking this through as I say it out loud as well. But the, just, yeah, the open border argument also has a, the same kind of argument as ending the drug war, right? Because you may, you might not be for heroin, but you can't be against it being imported into the country because you're going to work for free goods and services. Well, around. you know, um, Mark Emery, who we spoke about before, is not so much into heroin, but he's into like cannabis, mar yeah, right. marijuana, mm -hmm. cannabis, and uh, you see, with even with heroin, th there are cases for using heroin. Like, um, if you're in last stage terminal cancer and the morphine no longer works, and you're in mm -hmm. excruciating pain, maybe heroin is mm -hmm. or is some good. kind of derivative or of it. Morphine, some, or yeah. Well, yeah, morphine, yeah, yeah, I think, yeah. is a derivative of it. Yeah, pretty sure. Yeah. I'm not sure that. Yeah, I need I'm, yeah, I'm not too. Yeah, you need to say we, we both need. Yeah. Uh, we need a co author who knows about this. Yeah, stuff. all the drugs, yeah. <laughs> uh, a, a pharmacist or a doctor or something. But um, just take marijuana. I, I don't favor the use of marijuana, the recreational use. Heck, I don't even do wine or alcohol. Mm -hmm. uh, I yeah, do Diet Coke. Hardcore, yeah. <laughs> right. So, you know, I'm not personally going to use it, and I don't advocate anyone uses it, but I'm now not speaking as a libertarian. Because the libertarian, you know, that's a whole other issue, the thick versus the thin libertarians. Yeah, yeah. And I'm a thin, li I wish I were thinner, but I'm, <laughs> I'm a thin libertarian. And I believe that libertarian consists of solely the non-aggression principle, and that's it. Mm -hmm. None of this other stuff about being nice and, you know, not discriminating and all that yeah. stuff. That's just thick libertarianism. I'm a, a thin libertarian. Mm -hmm. So uh, as far as I'm concerned, we have, as thin libertarians, no views on marijuana or heroin or anything else. We just ask putting on our libertarian eyeglasses, is selling someone, an adult, I'm not talking about children, selling someone marijuana or heroin, is it per se violation of, of the non-aggression principle? And the answer is obviously no. Yeah, on that train of thought, I was wondering, because Dina Hopkin, because uh, he, he's famously, you know, in, I think it was Democracy, the guy that failed to talk about how to maintain a libertarian order, you know, you had to physically remove Democrats and communists. So that would... That wouldn't be a violation of non-aggression principle. Well, I disagree with Hans on this also. I mean, Hans has uh, said something about homosexuals, that we would remove homosexuals from yeah. polite society. I mean, you know, at one time I was a big fan of the homosexual. I'm straight. 
but uh, they had this riot uh, in New York City. I forget the name of the riot, the Stonewall Riots. Uh, what happened is it, this is in the 60s or the 50s or the 70s, I forget yeah. when, but what used to happen is that the, the gays would have uh, homosexual bathhouses where they would um, engage in um, sexual activity with each other between consenting adults. And therefore, it's, uh, it's compatible with the non-aggression principle. But the cops would keep busting them. And uh, at one time, the, the gays fought back. Sort of like the ranchers now in Oregon mm -hmm. or in um, Nevada. Nevada. Yeah, the Bundy Ranch. The Bundy yeah. Ranch and, and what's happening in, uh, in Oregon now. Mm -hmm. uh, they fought back, and I was cheering them on. But nowadays, the gays want uh, uh, positive rights. Po yeah. Like, uh, uh, you and I are getting married, and we want that guy to bake us a cake. Mm -hmm. He doesn't want to. And he doesn't want to, and, and, and uh, that poor baker has to pay 120000 fine for <laughs> refusing to uh, bake a cake for our homosexual wedding. I mean, you know, that's crazy. Mm -hmm. So I, I think the gays, the homosexuals, have gone from being compatible with libertarianism to being non-compatible. But being gay per se, is that a violation of rights? Of course not. No. So therefore, when Han says that they'll be excluded from polite society, I forget his exact words, but now he says he didn't really mean it that way, but... I think the way he might mean it is that in order to maintain that libertarian order, because um, the family is like the unit of society, right? And see, maybe now, that's... You see, now he's getting into thick libertarianism. Yeah. <laughs> and there are left-wing thick libertarians, and then there are right-wing right -wing. thick libertarians, and Hans is a right-wing thick libertarian. Because, like, uh, take Sheldon Richman or Roderick Long or any of these thick uh, libertarians. What they say is, it's not enough to promote liberty and, and to know what a libertarian society is. We have to uh, also be concerned about what will achieve a libertarian society and what, when, and if we achieve it, we'll keep it. Hmm. And then they start saying, well, you have to be nice. Yeah. You can't discriminate. But that... <laughs> yeah, that's kind of that, that's incompatible with libertarianism. We libertarians have this view of uh, free association. Mm -hmm. You know, you should only be able to associate with people that you want to. Look, the whole problem, God forbid, the New York Times is going to get on my case, the whole problem <laughs> with slavery was it violated free association. Mm -hmm. The slaves didn't want to associate <laughs> with the master. They wanted yeah. to be free. The whole problem with rape, and now the feminists won't like this, is that it violates free association. The victim doesn't want to associate with a rapist. She wants to be non-associated, and he <laughs> wants to associate with her against her will. Mm -hmm. uh, take the case of the uh, black sit-ins in Woolworths, uh, which led to the 1964 Civil Rights Act in the U.S. Okay. Uh, black people sat in on Woolworths' lunch counter. Oh, okay. Yeah, and yeah. Woolworths didn't want to serve them. Well, that's free association. Mm -hmm. The blacks were making Woolworths, in effect, victims of... Uh, association. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not saying it's nice to to refuse black people, but I'm saying they have a right. Yeah, Look, right. if I have a, a store and I say no blacks or Jews or bald people or people with hair, mm -hmm. that's my right as a libertarian. Mm -hmm. And and the left wing thick libertarians say, well, if people uh, are hateful and bigoted and prejudiced in this way, either we won't achieve libertarianism, or if we do, we won't keep it. And therefore, this is part of libertarianism. Mm -hmm. But Hans is making the same mistake. What he's saying is that the family is the foundation of uh, whatever, and I, I sort of more agree with Hans than these people, but mm -hmm. so if I had a pick, uh, <laughs> I would be a right-wing fixter, yeah. not a left-wing fixter, but I'm not a fixter at all. And Hans is saying, well, the family is important, heterosexual is important. Mm -hmm. Of course, now heterosexuality is under attack, and white men are under attack. Mm -hmm. So I, I, my sympathy is with Hans. But strictly speaking... It's a different issue as to what will promote libertarianism and what will sustain libertarianism for what libertarianism is. And you don't want to have uh, take a position that's where the two are incompatible. You don't want to uh, have libertarianism by means that are non-libertarian. Mm -hmm. Say a law against discrimination or a law saying that homosexuals have to be excluded from polite society or whatever the expression is. Mm -hmm. Maybe uh, libertarianism will be more achievable and more sustainable if we exclude homosexuality. Maybe. It's possible. Who knows? But still, <laughs> it's a violation of liberty mm -hmm. uh, to, to do any such thing. And similarly, maybe uh, uh, if we have the Canadian uh, laws that pr uh, 
you're not allowed to discriminate on the basis of race and sex and gender and this and mm -hmm. preference and that. Maybe libertarianism will be more achievable and more sustainable if we have those laws. But those laws are contrary to libertarianism. Yeah, they're still government laws, yeah. Well, not that the, it's not so much that they're government laws. I suppose the libertarian society had those laws. See, uh, there are, like the law of murder, the government has a law of murder. Mm -hmm. The government prohibits rape. And we favor those laws. Yeah. So it's not just that it's government. Right. Okay. Yeah. But you know, j just any law like that, you don't want it to be incompatible with libertarianism. Mm hmm Okay. Well, that explains that. <laughs> uh, do you want to get into social biology at all? Sure. Because sure, I find yeah, uh, that yeah. this uh, this will definitely trigger the feminists. Yes, and, they're, they're going to love this stuff. Yeah, and maybe even the New York Times, depending on how deep we get into it. <laughs> yes. But, yes. Um, well, I, well, I guess in a nutshell, it's basically. I think you wrote in the case against discrimination. Uh, was it uh, men are nature's crapshoot and women are nature's insurance policy? You want to explain what you mean by that? Sure. I'll I'll get into the whole thing. It's really okay. a two-part thing. Okay. The first part is why is it that men earn more than women, and the second is why do we have a glass ceiling? Mm -hmm. So it's really a two-part thing. Uh, the sociobiology comes in with the latter. So let me go over the whole thing okay, yeah. briefly. Uh, why is it that men earn more than women? Well, why is it that anyone earns anything? Mm. What determines wages? Well, what determines wages is productivity. Yeah. If I can produce um, 10 widgets an hour, and a widget is worth a dollar, then if you hire me to be on the shop floor of your widget factory, my productivity is 10 widgets or $10. What will be my wage? Well, in the free enterprise system, they go 10 toward $10. What's your opening bid? A penny. Mm -hmm. Because you're a capitalist pig, you want to exploit the yeah. But if you get me for a penny, you make nine ninety nine off of me. But this yeah. guy in the next room, he yeah. says, well, I applaud uh, you exploiting me, <laughs> but I'd rather exploit me, mm -hmm. and he'll offer two cents. Two cents, yeah. And then someone else will say three cents. Yeah, and just bids and up. where will this go? Well, if you suppose it gets to nine dollars, well now you're still making a dollar profit off of me. Mm -hmm. It'll go to nine oh one. Will it get to ten? Eh, in equilibrium it will, but we're never in equilibrium, but we're always tending in that direction. Mm -hmm. And if I'm alone out in Nova Scotia somewhere, uh, maybe it'll only be nine, nine fifty. Mm -hmm. uh, because the cost of finding me and transporting me to your factory are so prohibitive that you're not gonna worry about a dollar an hour. Mm -hmm. But if it was uh, my wage was two dollars an hour, you can make eight dollars an hour off of me. You might mm -hmm. scour the woods, which is why growers in California and Canada go down to Mexico with buses and bring the people up here, because they're being paid in Mexico less than their productivity here. Yeah. Okay. So we can see that wages below ten dollars an hour would be unstable. Well, how about wages above? Suppose you offer me fifteen. And I'm only worth 10. You're mm -hmm. losing five an hour. Yeah. And uh, you do that once too often, you go broke. Yeah. Can you offer me 1001? Well, yeah, what the heck. So mm -hmm. it's not like a rigid, it's got to be exactly 10, only in equilibrium. Yeah. And we're never in equilibrium. Equilibrium is sort of like a, uh, when all the market forces are, are uh, brought into bear, but it, the market is continually changing. Mm -hmm. But there's a tendency for wages to equal $10 an hour if my productivity is $10 an hour. Okay, so now the question is, well, why do men make more than women? And, you know, trigger warning here, trigger warning. <laughs> men are more productive. Yeah. It's got to be men are more productive, otherwise they'd be getting more money. Now, we have this thing in economics called specialization and division of labor. And the idea here is that whenever you do anything, no, I'm sorry, cross that out, it's, it's alternative costs. Okay. Whenever you do anything, you do it at the cost of not being able to do something else as well or at all. Mm -hmm. Now, Yo-Yo Ma is the best cellist. What's his time in the 100 yards? Not too oh, good. Not very good. Oh. Because he plays the cello all day mm -hmm. and he goes like this and you know, to run the 100 yards is very different. So he, if he would have trained in the 100 yards, he'd be better than he is now. Be a very good violin player. <laughs> but he wouldn't be a very good cellist. Or cellist, but, yeah. Or he'd be less. Yeah. Now, <coughs> Hussein Bolt is the best 100-yard racer right now. 
And the time is like 9.5, something you know, ungodly. It's like he's got a rocket ship somewhere. Yeah. <coughs> is he a good cellist? Probably not. Yeah. Because all he does all day is lift weights and do you know stuff that people who are track athletes do. Mm -hmm. Lift weights, jumps, whatever. Yeah, just train. So whenever you do anything, you do it at the cost of not being able to do something else as well as you otherwise could have. If Hussein Bolt had spent all this time playing the cello, I predict, without fear of contradiction, yeah. he'd be a much better cellist than he is now and a much worse runner than he is now. Mm -hmm. And Yo-Yo Ma, if he'd leave the cello alone and get into the gym, would knock down his 100-yard times and atrophy on the cello. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we've now established that whenever you do anything, you do it at the cost of something else mm -hmm. that you could have done, but you're not doing at all or as well. Okay. So now what I do when I give a lecture on this is I, I ask the audience, and there are men and women, uh, usually men if it's a libertarian <laughs> audience, <laughs> which is another issue of why there are so few women in libertarianism, and I'll get to that in a second. So I say, I'm going to give you a, a survey, and, and if you're married, think in terms of your marriage, and if you're not, think in terms of the marriage with which you're most familiar, your parents' marriage or the people who brought you up or whatever. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm going to give you three choices. The husband does equal amount of housework as the wife, housework being child care, shopping, cooking, cleaning, stuff like that. The husband does more than the wife, or the husband does less than the wife. And usually, if they're honest, uh, and if there's 100 people, I'll get one person who is a house husband and does more than the wife, and I'll get two or three people where it's equal. And it doesn't have to be 50-50, it'd be 40-60, call that equal. And then everyone else, the husband does much less. Yeah. And what does the husband do? He works. Does that works? Yeah. So, what the wife is doing is housework, at the cost of something else that she could have done better had she not done housework, namely business or working in this uh, factory that you now own. Mm -hmm. That's why women have less productivity than men in the market because they they specialize in housework. Mm -hmm. uh, it's interesting that the ratio of about 70-75% of female to male wage is true overall. But if you bifurcate it, if you take never married men and women, men and women who've never been married, widowed, divorced, separated, nothing, mm -hmm. just single, there's no wage gap. Hmm. Yeah, it's like and if you take ever married, then the wage gap is not 30%, it's more like 50%. And another, you see, that's the empirical proof or the empirical evidence. Yeah. The um, economic proof is that if there really were a wage gap where a man who's worth 10 is getting 10, and here's a woman sitting here, and she's also worth 10, and you're only paying her 7, you're making $3 an hour off of her. You're going to want to hire more like her and fire me. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's yeah. untenable. Mm -hmm. So that's the explanation of why women earn less than men. Okay, now, why is it that we have a glass ceiling? So first, what is a glass ceiling? A glass ceiling is women can rise, but they can only rise so high, and they can't get through this glass ceiling, or very few can get above it. Like take presidents of a country or premiers or prime ministers. Mm -hmm. On the fingers of two hands is Indira Gandhi, Rosa Meir from Israel, Angela Merkel. From yeah, Germany. Uh, I think we had like one, two, three, at least three premiers in Canada. That I okay, <laughs> the, three premiers. Yeah. Plus, there was a prime minister. Uh, oh, yeah, Kim woman. Campbell. Kim Campbell. Yeah. Was, does she count, though? Because I don't. she was never she elected. Shut up. Yeah. Shut up. She counts. You <laughs> sexist pig. But that's a good example. You're disgusting. Uh, <laughs> hey, you're talking about the patriarchy here. Yeah, right. That's no. why. It's not because you're... <laughs> economic mumbo jumbo. It's because of the patriarchy. No, no, we're counting Kim Campbell. Okay. But how many you got? There was one in Venezuela or someone in Brazil. Yeah. There's one in Brazil now. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so yeah, not a lot. Uh, yeah. 10, 15. And how many, and this is in the history of the uh, species, mm -hmm. how many men have been prime ministers or premiers or whatever? All the ones that all were the, all the, Everyone else, you know, 10,000 yeah. maybe, 50,000. Yeah. So the glass ceiling is not that the women can't get there, but very, very few can get past the glass ceiling. So that's one example of a glass ceiling. Another is um, grandmasters in chess. 
most of them. Mm-hmm. Virtually all. Yeah. Um, before the uh, three sisters, I forget the name of these three sisters, there was only one woman who was a grandmaster, a Russian, and she was ranked 450th. Polgar, P-O-L-G-A-R. There are three sisters from Hungary. Who are, the worst one is around 300th, the middle one is around 200th, and the best one, Judith Polgar, is ranked 50th. Three out of 500. Yeah. Glass ceiling. Hmm. Um, another example is uh, Nobel Prizes. And not in poetry or uh, this sort of BS Nobel Prizes where uh, God knows what they're doing and they're politically correct. Yeah, especially nowadays. I've heard like no woman. white male would ever win a Nobel Peace Prize in, for fiction or poetry right. or something. Yeah, not now. Well, maybe one or two, but uh, yeah. very rare. But I'm yeah. talking about Nobel Prizes in medicine or Engine, physics. Yeah. Um, uh, the, uh, what do you call it? The Fields Prize in math, economics. Mm-hmm. Well, in economics, there's one woman. Well, that is also kind of like poetry, too, though. The, the mainstream shut economics up, <laughs> is How subjective you? and, How you know, dare you? <laughs> politically correct. This interview but is over. <laughs> I'm leaving. Yeah, that's it. That's, I'm <laughs> triggered. I'm, I've, I've, had it. I've had it with you, boy. This was supposed to be a safe space. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So anyway, um, what's her name? Eleanor Ostrom okay. won the Nobel Prize. And, and I think uh, th- there was this other woman in the 1920s before the Nobel Prizes probably would have won it, but one out of about a hundred. So Nobel, and, and there was Madame Curie who won it in chemistry or medicine or something, but one person. So mm-hmm. again, we have examples of uh, the glass ceiling. Yeah. So now the question is, why do we have it? And now I have to use the whiteboard. Absolutely, that's why it's here. Okay, now here's the whiteboard. And what I'm going to do is use a bell curve, which is also politically incorrect. <laughs> yeah, of course. Because you Charles Murray and Richard Ernst. That's a racist book. It's right, been discredited. Right, right. Yes, right. <laughs> but I'm going to use the bell curve anyway. It's a statistical thing. Yeah. And what I'm going to do is I'll put the... Um, oh, this pen is oh, not that one. Here, try that. as black. good as it could there. be. Uh, that's better. Okay, so here is a, a frequency distribution. Can... Uh, um, how does it look on the, is anybody in there? Hello? <laughs> yeah, okay, I didn't see him. Does it look good? Maybe if I got closer here, I don't know. Is that good? <laughs> Can you see it? Uh, here we go, that turn it around. So, uh, maybe I can go back a bit. Okay, so you want to use that one there. <laughs> oh, here, Dan's here. Here, if you, if you just, and then he can kind of frame it up and you can, okay, so. Yeah. Okay, so here's a frequency distribution. I'm going to put over here good, a G, and over here a D for bad. And I'm going to make a a two frequency distribution. One, this will be the female. And here is the male. And I'll put an M for male and an F for female. And this is uh, the average. say IQ, 100 IQ is the average IQ for everybody, and way out here you get three or four standard deviations above the mean, and way out here you get three or four standard deviations below the mean. And what I've been talking about is the good. I've been talking about IQ points, and uh, presidents, and uh, grandmasters in chess, (coughs) and um, what else, Um, uh, Nobel Prizes and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And you can see that way out here, the males are way above the females. There's very, very few females, and many, many males. And that's in the good area. Now let's talk about the bad area. What's going on here? Again, the males outweigh the females. The females only outweigh the males in the middle. And this is why I say that uh, females are God's or nature's insurance policy, because all the women are clustered here, mm-hmm. whereas males are God or nature's um, Crap yeah. Okay, so what's going on here in the bad area? Okay, she's oh, okay. Here. That's good. That good? Yeah, that's good. So what's going on in the bad area? So in the good area, we had uh, chess, and we had uh, Nobel Prizes, 
And we had politicians. Look, I'm not a big fan of politicians, but I have to acknowledge that if you get to be president, you must have something going You're for you. Pretty good at backstabbing, lying, and cheating. Well, <laughs> with the exception of Ron Paul. Oh, of course. Well, he never. Yeah. Well, he. He, he should have been. He was a yeah. congressman, yeah. so he knew something. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, so what's going on in the bad area? Well, in the bad area, we have. Um, um, what do you call it? Uh, prison. Who's in prison? You go to the prisons, and. Virtually all men. Very, very few women in prison. Mm -hmm. You go to um, uh, insane asylums or mental institution, insane or mental institution, who do you find? All men. 2% women, whatever. Very, very few women, a lot of men. Mm -hmm. You go to um, uh, street uh, homeless people. Homeless. You see a woman begging on the street. It, wow, there's a woman begging on the street. It's very rare. You go to the cemetery. Now, in the cemetery, of course, it will be equal because we all go there eventually. However, if you look at the cemetery and see who went there before their time, and forget about the fact that 50 years ago, childbirth was not as good as it is now, and a lot of women, young women, died. Mm -hmm. Forget about that. But uh, in the last 30 years, Look at who's dying before their time. Say who's dying in their 20s and 30s. Virtually all men. Mm -hmm. Very, very few women. So again, you have this uh, bifurcation. And that's why you have the glass ceiling, because women are clustered toward the middle, and men are at the tails of the distribution. That's why you have a glass ceiling. It's biological. OK. Now, the next step in this analysis is, is it necessarily true? Could it have been otherwise? Now, suppose there were two societies just like us, our forebears, and this other group. Call them the, who are those other guys? Um, Neanderthal. Neanderthal. Uh, or some other group like that. And let's say that they had the same brain capacity, the same opposable thumb, the same power. Everything was the same. Only. With them, it was reversed. Females were like this, and males were like that. Who would win out? Win out in the competition to populate the Earth, and who would go extinct? Well, these females are incapable, they're capable of having children, which is biology, but they're not capable of bringing up children. They're not capable of taking care of children. Mm -hmm. And if you need the men to go hunting and the women to stay home and, and you know take care of children, these women can't do it because they're too busy being in prison or in insane asylums or homeless or in the cemetery. So we have an advantage over them on that. And also, we have an advantage over here. See, in our group, there are a lot of men and very few females. How many babies can a woman have? 10, 12? How many babies can a man have? Hundreds of thousands. Well, if he's a busy boy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, Genghis Khan, I think, had, I don't know, 10,000. Uh, what's his name? That basketball player, uh, Will Chamberlain, bragged that he went to bed with 20,000 women. Wow. He could have had 20,000. I don't know if we believe him, but yeah. you know, he could have had 20,000 kids. But you see, over here, uh, there are very few, in, in this other group, there are very few men that can, <laughs> sorry. Here, out here, three, four uh, standard deviations above the mean in this other society, it's mainly females that are like that. But females can only have ten children. Mm -hmm. So we we will beat them in both of these regards. Yeah. Okay, now the question is, why are there so few women in the libertarian movement? Right here, I think there are five men and one woman here. Uh, yeah, that's usually. Sort of, yeah. Uh, that's, that's probably a high ratio for women. <laughs> we don't usually get one fifth. <laughs> yeah. Why is it that there are so few women? Is it because we're all sexist pigs and we hate women? That's ridiculous. Most of us are heterosexual and uh, we uh, like women. Why then? Well, uh, women are God's or nature's insurance policy. They don't want to take risks. Men are the crap sheep. Men are much more willing to take risks. So who's going to vote for a, a big daddy government that says, I'll take care of you? 
more women. Now, there were some women um, in, in this country. There's Wendy McElroy, there's um, Karen Selleck, there's Alana Mercer, who used to be here but now in the US. These are libertarian women who are magnificent libertarians, but they're very few. Mm -hmm. Most uh, libertarians are, are men because of this biological divergence. So that's sort of a three-part thing. One, why men earn more than women because of specialization, productivity, alternative costs. Secondly, why is there a glass ceiling? Because of this, uh, they're about equal on the, on the, on the average. Mm -hmm. But men are either brilliant or stupid, whereas most women are just pretty good. And the third one is this um, crapshoot versus insurance policy. So that would be my answer to the question of why women earn less than men, why um, we have a glass ceiling, and why there are so few women in the return movement. And there's another thing, another issue that's biological that I might raise, and that is why do we have so few libertarians? Which is a different issue of why we have a proportionally few women. Yeah. And the answer there is also sociobiological. Um, benevolence, right? Is, sorry? Is it benevolence? Is that what you're going to say? Or yeah, say benevolence. Right? <laughs> Boy, you're, you're up on my stuff. I am, <laughs> yeah. You break my stuff. Um, <clears throat> the issue here is why did Ron Paul only get 1% of the vote? Why uh, Tim Mullen, who is the head of the uh, Canadian Libertarian Party, I mean, he's very, very well spoken. Mm -hmm. He's uh, tall and slim and very good looking, which, I mean, his hair is as good as um, Trudeau's, Trudeau's hair. Oh, yeah, I they mean, could have had a hair off. and they, Yeah, yeah the, I mean, the, if they had a beauty contest, uh, I mean, part of the reason Trudeau won is he's very beautiful. Yeah, if only it. our democracy actually was more of a beauty contest, we well, might have had a chance of winning well, this Well, yes, one. Tim Moen <laughs> is, is beautiful uh, as, uh, as um, uh, Trudeau, Justin Trudeau. Mm -hmm. And yet, uh, Justin Trudeau won, and Tim Mullen got the usual libertarian 1% of the votes. Uh, why did Rand, Ron Paul do so badly? Rand Paul is, you know, a quasi, semi-demi-libertarian. He's not mm -hmm. really his father's son. Why this is this? unfortunate. I'm sorry? I was just saying, it's kind of unfortunate, too. Oh, it's, it's like yeah. the bad strategy move. You're never going to win over the GOP, and you've kind of alienated, you know, Guys like me that would have been up there supporting yes, Rand. Yes, I mean, people were rabid for Ron. Uh, yeah. One of my books was on Ron Paul, sort of my love letter to Ron Paul. I mean, yeah. I just love him and revere him. He's just magnificent. He's the reason I'm here. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people, you know, you, you, whenever I give speeches nowadays, I ask, well, why are you guys here? And who was the one who affected you most? Rand Paul and Ayn Rand. Yeah. Or, or Ron Paul, sorry. Uh, uh, sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Ron Paul and, thanks, and, 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 and Ayn Rand yeah. for the older generation. Mm -hmm. But the younger generation, it's uh, Ron Paul. Uh, so why only 1%? And why was he treated so miserably by the media when he was running in 08 and in 12? Mm -hmm. I think it's sociobiology. So let's go into that. So what is sociobiology? Sociobiology is the theory that we are the way we are now because of what it took a million years ago or 100,000 years ago or 2 million years ago. Again, I'm not a <laughs> biologist here or a zoologist. Uh, whenever we were in the caves or the trees or wherever we were, whatever it took to live and, and you know, Dawkins had the Selfish Gene book, a very good book, mm -hmm. where he says that biological success is leaving uh, replicas of yourself into the next generation. So the the sociobiology theory is we are the way we are because of what it took to lead children <coughs> into the next generation. <coughs> I've got to get a, a zip of water here. All right, it's all yours. <laughs> We're not communist here. We don't share our water. <laughs> That's your private property. <coughs> so let me give you a few examples of <coughs> sociobiology. <coughs> Sorry. Um, one of them is when a baby cries, and I just have uh, grandchildren, they're almost a year old now, and when they cry, our tribe is a tribe that when the baby cries, it goes right through us. Mm -hmm. we <laughs> we're motivated, and not just the women, men too. Mm -hmm. Take care of the baby. Suppose there was this other tribe where uh, they didn't really care, baby cries, who cares? 
and yet they had the same opposable thumb, the same strength, the same brain, everything was the same, but they didn't give a, a rat's rear end about babies, well, which do you predict will <laughs> survive yeah, yeah, which one? And, and leave children to the next generation? Obviously, worrying about babies is uh, biologically, sociobiologically important for explaining us. The reason we worry about babies is because we are the children of people who worried about babies. Whereas there were other people who didn't worry about babies, they're not our grandparents. They didn't leave much progeny, and each uh, generation left less and less progeny. Another example is uh, snakes versus bathtubs. Um, if a snake started crawling through these offices, <laughs> everybody you know, would yeah. <laughs> take this thing and you know try to bash it or something. Whereas a bathtub, who's afraid of a bathtub? Bathtub, big deal. A lot of people are afraid of snakes. Not necessarily. I think uh, children are only afraid of, um, what is it, uh, loud noises and falling or something like that. I forget. Uh, maybe it's not biological, but we people are inclined to be afraid of snakes. Mm -hmm. And we're not afraid to be inc uh, afraid of bathtubs. Why? Because a million years ago, if somebody saw a bathtub and wasn't afraid of it or was afraid of it, it meant nothing. Yeah, it was... But if they weren't afraid of snakes, they didn't leave too many children. Yeah. You go over and pat the snake and... Bites you and... Yeah, bites you, you and go. you're not leaving children in the next generation. Mm -hmm. And yet, nowadays, bathtubs kill many more people than snakes. Mm -hmm. So that's the second instance of sociobiology. The third one is a lot of actresses who become 50, 55, 60 years old, Jane Fonda, I think she's 70, still beautiful, can't get the uh, movie... Uh, what do you call it, um, uh, slots as an ingenue anymore? Mm -hmm. Why? Because our grandparents, great-grandparents, when they saw a 50, 60-year-old woman, they said, eh. When they saw a 22-year-old woman, they said, whoop de doo let me at her. Mm -hmm. Fertile. <laughs> suppose, <laughs> suppose there was this other tribe that said, oh, 50-year-old woman, whoop de doo let me at her, and a 50... Uh, uh, a 20 year old woman or girl, they say, oh, not ripe, you know, sort of like Justin Trudeau, not ready yet. Yeah, just not ready. Well, which tribe is going to lead more children? Obviously, oh. our tribe that mm -hmm. looks on 20 to 30 year old women uh, as sex objects and 50 or 60 or 70 year old women, even if they're pretty, uh, not as much as sex objects. Mm -hmm. Well, the reason we are that way is because of sociobiology. Okay, so now let's get to economics, or rather to libertarianism. Why so few libertarians? Mm -hmm. Now, there are two ways to, um, to help each other. One is benevolence, and the second is through markets. And both are evolutionarily good, namely that they lead to more children than other ones. Mm -hmm. Take benevolence. This week I'm sick, you're in my tribe, you help me. Next week you're sick, I help you. Our tribe lives and we prosper and we leave more children to the next generation. Now there's this other tribe, again, equally able in every other way, except they don't really give a rat's rear end about each other. Mm -hmm. So I'm sick this week, you say, yeah, tough on you. Oh, yeah. uh, next week you're sick, I say the same to you, we're not going to do as well. So we are hardwired to be benevolent. Mm -hmm. Look, there are five or six people in the audience. If somebody fell into a dead faint, we would stop this interview and call an ambulance. Mm -hmm. Uh, there are cases where, you know, strangers, you know, see somebody lying on the floor, not a bum, but a, you know, well-dressed person or, you know... Somebody collapses in the street. Somebody yeah. collapses in the streets. Everyone, you know... Rushes over. Rushes yeah, over yeah. to help. The, we have cell phones. We call an ambulance. We have benevolence. We are very generous. Uh, the U.S., I think, is one of the most generous in terms of um, charity, private charity, Canada, mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. We have all sorts of the Red Cross and, you know, the... The uh, stuff in you know cancer society and all that stuff, people contribute to that with no gun pointed at them. So we are hardwired to our benevolence. But there's another way we can help each other, and that is through markets. Mm. Because specialization, division of labor, uh, people that are. Um, I mean, we now owe our very lives to specialization and division of labor. If we're all yeah. independent uh, jacks of all trades, most of us would die. Mm -hmm. So a second way to support ourselves is through trade. 
Now, originally I wrote this article saying just this, and a friend of mine who is now a co-author with me, John Levendis, one of my um, co-authors, uh, one of my fellow professors at Loyola, by the way, let me get an advertisement for Loyola. Oh, God. If anyone, any of you young people or grandparents who have grandchildren that are of college age, send them down to Loyola, you'll get some free enterprise, whereas you go to these other colleges, all you get is pinko crap. Mm -hmm. Okay, back to, <laughs> back to sociobiology. So what he said is, look, you go back to cavemen, and they discovered that each caveman tribe was 50 or 100 people, and yet there were 3,000 pots over here buried. And over here, there were 3,000 spears. And over here, there were 3,000 fish hooks or mm -hmm. something. From this, we discern or we deduce that they traded then. Mm -hmm. So therefore, you're wrong, he said. See, I was saying that we're hardwired against trade because we never traded in, in uh, cavemen or whatever. Then, yeah. He says we did too. So we got a third co-author who is a biologist. Okay, finally, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and the three of us co-authored this article, which has been rejected everywhere, but we're keeping on trying yeah. to get it published. And what he said is, you're both right. Hmm. We are more hardwired for benevolence than trade because, because benevolence goes way back. Yeah. Whereas trade only goes back 10,000 years or whenever we found these pots or mm -hmm. these uh, fish hooks. And not only does benevolence go back to the beginning of human beings when we were apes, but it goes back to mammals. The mother deer has got benevolence for mm -hmm. the baby deer. Yeah. And even the mother alligator does something for the baby alligators. I'm not sure about that. Yeah. But certainly it goes way back to, uh, to when we were mammals. Yeah. If we believe in uh, the earth is not 6,000 years old and we believe in <laughs> biology, which I do. That's a whole other story I can get into uh, <laughs> about the global warming. Um, but I'll, I'll stick to this for the moment. The, uh, whereas our adherence or our hardwiredness for trade is only superficial, whereas our hardwiredness for benevolence is very, very deep and very abiding. So when I get freshman kids in my class and we talk about price gouging, yeah. They don't realize that price gouging is a way of helping each other. I was in New Orleans when Katrina came, and by the way, it wasn't Katrina. Katrina missed us by 40 miles. It was the Army Corps of Engineers mm -hmm. whose uh, levees fell, and they didn't go broke because they're government. Yeah, of course, and they're and, probably you know, still in charge. <laughs> oh, yes, and if the Mississippi River Corporation did that, they'd be broke, they'd be but gone, that's yeah. a whole other issue. Yeah. Um, and I tell them that benevolence is helpful because, look, New Orleans was really in a bad way right after the Katrina episode. Mm -hmm. And there were two motivations to get people to help us. One, benevolence. And there was. People came from Montana, from Boston, from Canada, from Mexico. To, they came to help us. And the, um, <laughs> the uh, what do you call it, the um, uh, government agency in charge? Was it FEMA or was it, uh, or is it something else? Uh, some, I forget the name of it wouldn't allow them to come because they didn't they, a bunch of doctors came and, and they wouldn't allow them to come because they weren't good on, on uh, feminist studies or something. It was just a horrible situation. But the point is one motivation for helping us was benevolence. People would just come and bring in uh, bags of ice or mm -hmm. uh, orange juice or, yeah. or doctors would come or people would come and try to rebuild. But the second motivation was greed and capitalism and, and self-interest profits. Mm -hmm. Look, if um, we wouldn't allow prices to rise because of the shortages, the first few people into the Walmart would buy 10 gallons of orange juice. Well, that's actually, yeah, a, a real life example. I was in Alberta uh, when they had their big flood a couple of years ago, and uh, I worked uh, behind a chicken counter, and I did, told the boss, like, well, we should, you know, usually $10, buy a little chicken. Well, we got to raise the price, sir. You know, everyone's going to come in and, like, yeah, just that hardwired, like, no, we can't do that. That's not fair. Well, then the first couple guys, you know, took way more chicken than they needed because, you know, there's uncertainty when you can get your next roast chicken. And, you know, people came by and it was like, well, there's no more chicken left. Precisely. Oh. So uh, price gouging, namely raising the price of the chicken or the orange juice or the baby diaper or whatever it is, is good because it evens out the distribution. The first guys don't really need 10 gallons of uh, chicken or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. uh, they could do with one mm -hmm. and leave something for the other people. 
The second reason is some people come from Montana. <laughs> some people come from California. Some people come from Ontario. Some people come from British Columbia to help the New Orleanians. Mm -hmm. But more would come if there was money in it for them. Mm -hmm. yeah. And yet, if you don't allow price gouging, I mean, That's the point. high prices is sort of like a cry for help in the wilderness. Yeah. And price gouging laws or prohibition of price gouging like having decibel controls. If you're lost in the woods, you want to yell, help! very loudly yeah. but imagine if they had decibel control and can all go help yeah then <laughs> so profits are a lure profits are an, an attempt to get people to um to help help out yeah somebody's selling you know bottles of water yeah 10 bucks a piece water, like oh it's the sign that early it costs uh, 50 cents or a dollar mm -hmm. if it costs ten dollars people would then say, well, I'm going to bring a whole truckload yeah, and, and sell it and, for and make 990, money. 990, right. and the same Absolutely, thing. and push down the price, mm -hmm. precisely. But my freshman students, <laughs> they're hardwired <laughs> Hard against this. Yeah. So it's sort of difficult. Hmm. And I think there are only some people who uh, have a, um, I don't know, some biological thing of, what is it when you have a, there's a word I'm trying to think of, uh, we have a different kind of an eye or something, or a different kind of nose. Ah, I can't think of the word. Mm -hmm. Where your biology is different. Only libertarians have a this biolog mutation. Mutation. That's the word I was looking for. There's a libertarian mutation where some people, one or two percent of the population, are not born libertarians, like I wasn't born. Mm -hmm. You weren't probably born, but you we were born open, such that if we heard it, we were open. And then 99 percent of the people don't have this libertarian openness mutation where they're open to libertarianism. Mm -hmm. And so I think the, the reason that we have so few libertarians is because there are very few people that are hardwired to either be open to this because they have this mutation or because of sociobiology, we're, we're benevolent and the benevolence overrides the um, depreciation of markets for everyone, even us, mm -hmm. but uh, some, but but the openness to markets is much more superficial. It's only 10,000 years or something. Like in, mm -hmm. when we're in the caves or the trees, there wasn't markets, there wasn't um, interest, it, there weren't banks. Being open to markets like kind of be, uh, benevolent, though, because I, cause I want humanity to, you know, progress and, you know, get out of poverty and that, then I would, therefore, if you know, really want to be, you know, hardwired, I'd support markets. Or is that just my mutation speaking? Well, I think that's your mutation speaking. Most people think that if you want to help people, like Bernie Sanders wants to help people, what you mm -hmm. do is you take from the rich and give to the poor. Yeah. You use the state violence. You use the state violence to attack people. Some are crony capitalists and deserve it, and others are not mm -hmm. and don't deserve it, but you attack them all because they're in the 1%. And the 1% has to pay more, and, and the poor people have to get more. So what you do uh, to help people is to uh, equalize the, um, the pie. Hmm. The problem with them is Bernie Sanders has two eyes. <laughs> yeah. There are people with no eyes. Exactly. You yeah. don't see Bernie Sanders giving up one of his eyes. Mm -hmm. Bernie Sanders is a bright guy. It's true he's a commie, uh, whatever, but he's, he's not stupid. Mm -hmm. He uh, graduated college at uh, University of Chicago, a great school. Why don't we take 50 IQ points away from him, and if we could, give it to somebody else who really has a low IQ. Would yeah. Bernie agree to do that? No. Yeah. Bernie is a hypocrite. And all of these egalitarians are hypocrites. And most of these egalitarians, they're professors at universities, and they drive, uh, maybe not a Maserati, but they drive a Volkswagen or you know a, a Subaru or something. Mm -hmm. And they live in a nice house with three bathrooms, and they have a wristwatch, and they have all sorts of stuff. And mm -hmm. yet the report here... They're hypocrites. Yeah. Whereas we libertarians are not hypocrites. We believe in the non-aggression axiom, non-aggression principle, and we don't rape, we don't murder, we don't steal. Uh, namely, we're compatible with our views. They're not compatible with their own views. Mm -hmm. Now, let me get on to this other point where I was going to sort of have a side point uh, where, as I said, I'm, I'm not a biologist, but I believe in biology. Okay. <laughs> and then I was going to get into global warming. Global warming, right. See, the reason I believe that the Earth is 3 billion years old, or whatever it is, whatever the scientists say, or 4 billion, 4.5 billion, yeah, that sounds right. whereas the Bible people believe it's 6,000 years old because they added up in the Bible how, you know, the yeah. length of the lives and all. The reason I believe that is because 
specialization and division of labor. I'm just an economist with a little interest in philosophical libertarianism, and I'm not an expert in chemical engineering, and I'm not an expert in, um, I don't know, uh, garbage removal, and I'm not an expert in shoemaking, and I'm not an expert in many, many things. And yet I trust those other people because in these other areas, they have free debate. So when the uh, biologists or the meteorologists or whoever, archaeologists tell us it's 4.5 billion years old, what's his name, the guy in the wheelchair? Um, Stephen Hawking. Hawking. Yeah. When he says it, he comes from a dialogue where anyone can say anything and, and the test of truth was the, the logic and the empirical evidence. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like you and Murray, right? You know, he wanted criticism. If you could, you yes. know, kind of like what Hoppe did with yes. the ethics of liberties. Right. Yeah, so as it's, long as it's free okay. debate. Yeah. yeah, look, in in physics, there's a debate. Uh, there's a debate between is Earth, is matter, more like a, a string or a particle? Mm -hmm. Now I don't know anything about that, but I notice, and and it seems to be that they're not sure. But suppose the string people win out, and the, they all agree it's a string and not a particle. I'll go along with the string. I don't know what the hell they're talking about, <laughs> yeah, but I'll go along with the point, string yeah. because they're having a fair debate. Mm -hmm. The string people are not threatening the particle people that you lose your job if you're a particle person. Mm -hmm. The particle people are not trying to use RICO, which is the thing against criminals, mm -hmm. for the string people. They're not trying to put them in jail. Yeah, they're not. Yeah, It's not dogma. It's not a dogma, and, and, and it's an open debate. Mm -hmm. They're after the truth. But in, in global warming, it's not like that. Mm -hmm. In global warming, there's um, uh, uh, Suzuki, uh, yeah, yeah, the, the, Canadian the global the Canadian dude, guy, and, and these other guys at Penn State in East Anglia. Mm -hmm. What they're trying to do is not allow the other people to be published mm -hmm. and get them to lose their jobs, and then they're trying to get them put in jail. And they call them climate deniers, and yeah, you know where they get the word denier? That, yeah, it invokes from the Holocaust. Holocaust. Yeah. Which, and, and now I'm going to say something that is very, very politically incorrect, and we really should have a trigger warning. Trigger warning. You know, we should like a big sign. Big trigger, trigger warning mm -hmm. here. The, look, the same thing with the Holocaust. There's no fair debate over the Holocaust. No, there in isn't, some actually. countries, yeah. you can be put in jail. Oh, this one here. Like, you can't criticize if, the, if, Jewish if, religion. If you doubt that the Holocaust occurred, not only are you considered anti... And by the way, I'm Jewish. Mm -hmm. I lost cousins and uncles in the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. I believe in the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. But I note that if, if, uh, if you deny this, you can go to jail in Canada and in, in Europe. In the U.S., happily, you can't go to jail, yeah. but you lose your job. Yeah. So what kind of a debate is that? <laughs> so therefore, the rational person who knows nothing about this and say doesn't have a selfish interest like I do, or not so much selfish interest, but a personal interest because my relatives were killed, mm -hmm. a person like that, if he adopted the view that I had toward the um, global warming, would say, look, this is unknown. We can't trust these guys. Because if they were really secure in their positions, they wouldn't try to get their opposition to put in jail and lose their jobs. They would just... You know, what do they say? The sunlight is the best um, cleanser oh, right. for debate or something? Yeah, I forget. Like. There's something like that. Some yeah. expression like that. Namely, the, the solution to hate speech is truth. Yeah. But they don't allow truth. They put you in jail yeah. if, if you uh, deny what they say. So I, uh, I am, um, what's the word um, when you don't know? Um, there's atheist, uh, theist. Ag Agnostic. agnostic. I'm an agnostic on global warming because mm -hmm. I don't trust those guys. Yeah. Because the, the, the people who believe in global warming or global change or whatever it is they keep yeah, changing. Whatever they keep calling By the it, way, yeah. in the 1970s, they were afraid of global cooling. Yeah, the nice age. In the yeah. 1990, and then in the 1990s, it was global warming, so they switched to global warming. Mm -hmm. And then there was some time when there wasn't any global warming, so now they switched to global change. Mm -hmm. Well, this is irrefutable. I mean, the weather always changes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, you know... Uh, they, they can't be ever proven wrong because the climate will change. Mm -hmm. So I'm an agnostic on that. I, it's not that I believe it or disbelieve it. And now I get to the can opener joke. Yeah, oh, I don't think I've heard this you one. Heard, joke. You're, you're pathetic. Oh, well, maybe I have then. <laughs> <laughs> there were three uh, people marooned on an island and they had cans of food and no can opener. There was a physicist, a chemist, and an economist. 
And the uh, physicist said, let's drop the can from a certain height onto a rock of a certain hardness and we'll open it up and we can eat it. The chemist said, no, it's pretty good, but we can do better. Let's yeah. heat it up, certain temperature, pressure, it'll open up and yeah. we'll have warm food. And they turn to the economist and say, how can you help in our deliberations? And he says, assume a can open. Yes. <laughs> The point is that we don't have controlled experiments in yeah. economics. We have to use logic. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the point is, I assume global warming is true. I just taught a class in environmental economics. Mm -hmm. So what I did is I said, let's assume that these guys are right. Now what? Now let's assume these guys are right. Now what? Mm -hmm. So I sort of uh, uh, elude the whole debate. I, I, I yeah. I don't have to take a position on the debate. I assume can open us. <laughs> so that would be the way I would analyze it. I see. Yeah, that's what I've always said is that, well, either it's, you know, it's all a big hoax and it's not happening or it's, you know, kind of a lukewarm problem where, you know, maybe two, three hundred years, we kind of got to think this through. Or, you know, the alarmists are right, we've got ten years. Either way, like putting the state in charge with carbon taxes, cap and trade, all environmental regulations, that not the answer. Well, I think the burden of proof is on he who wants to change things. You know, mm -hmm. possession is nine-tenths of the law. I now have this watch, so we assume it's my watch, and if you want to grab it and say, well, I stole it from you yesterday, the burden of proof is on you to prove that it was your watch yesterday or you have a picture of yourself wearing it. Mm -hmm. Well, these guys want to change everything. Mm -hmm. And then they have the audacity to say that the burden of proof is on the other side, yeah. and then they have the even greater audacity to say, oh, we should put people in jail who disagree with us. Mm -hmm. And this settled science, Al Gore is always yakking on yeah, about settled, settled, yeah. settled science kind is a contradiction. Oxymoron, yeah. yeah, oxymoron. It's a contradiction in terms. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're at two hours, I was just told. So, well, uh, I think yeah. that's probably enough. <laughs> yeah, you do have uh, a meter running outside, and I've got to use the bathroom. <laughs> yeah, well, two hours is a long time. No, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's good. Uh, I always feel it's more like a podcast than a show, but uh, well, we do have we, video. So. We, we've covered a lot of subjects, and it's been a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was uh, great hearing those uh, Murray Rothbard stories right from you, sitting right there. Uh, six years ago, I was just watching you on YouTube, just learning about... You actually, you, you, uh, before I came across Rothbard's article on, um, um, you know, property rights, like pollution violation, yeah, I saw it was your video. I think it, it's an old one from like, you, you were with the Fraser Institute, I think, and uh, you, you still didn't have any hair, but it was, <laughs> it was an older one. It was darker. <laughs> yeah, and, yeah, it was what was there. It was all dark. And uh, yeah, you, I just, the first time I heard that whole, the whole spiel of libertarian uh, property rights thing for the environment. And, uh, yeah. yeah, no, I worked for the Fraser Institute from 1979 to 1991, and then I got fired for being too libertarian. Too, too radical. Yeah, so. <laughs> well, you just got in a fight, uh, like on an email exchange with one of those guys, because they, they have their, they rank the top ten. Yeah, uh, Mike Walker thinks that he's the one that started that idea, and I think you. I'm the one that started the it idea. It sounds more like a libertarian thing to think of. Yeah, yeah. well, thank you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Once again, I'm an agnostic on the issue. I don't yes, know yes, much. Yes. I wasn't even alive, probably, right. when this happened. So. But I'm not threatening to put him in jail. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. And he's that not is. threatening to put me in jail, so, so we're okay. Good open debate. <laughs> yeah. Well, Walter Block, thanks for coming on my show. Thanks for having me. It was yeah. a pleasure. Anytime, anytime. And, uh, yeah, I guess we can hit the stop button whenever that happens, if there's a delay or we're good. <laughs>